Good afternoon and welcome to the Green Mountain Care Board meeting. My name is Kevin Mullen and uh, we have uh, an exciting board meeting planned for today. And to, to start off, I want to um, thank uh, the members of the legislature who are in attendance and also the members of the congressional delegation staff that are in attendance. And uh, we always appreciate it when uh, you come to one of our meetings. And we thank you for uh, spending your time with us this afternoon. Um, the first thing that I wanted to do, um, which is not on the agenda, but the first thing I wanted to do was welcome our newest board member, Tom Walsh. And I thought maybe it would be appropriate if uh, Tom introduced himself to everyone. We're very grateful to have Tom as the newest member of the board. Tom? Thank you, Chair Mullen. I'm thrilled to be here with you all. Um, just a little bit of a background. Um, <clears throat> I grew up in a single parent home in a small rural part of northern New York State. My first, um, I'm a first generation college student. I'm also nervous talking in front of people. <laughs> I went to school to become a physical therapist and became very interested in health outcomes and how to measure those. Um, that eventually brought me to Dartmouth College where I received a master's degree in outcome research and eventually a, a PhD in health policy. After graduating from there, I've continued to teach. <clears throat> I also, I've taught at other universities across the country. I started a small consulting firm, helping universities and states build education systems to help healthcare systems adapt to changes in healthcare. Um, my most recent work has been with the Joint Commission, where I've led a team designing ways to assess the reliability and safety of large systems and worked with uh, the VA healthcare system and Navy Medicine to develop the skills, principles, and practices needed to adapt to um, changes in health policy. Um, so that's enough to get started. Thank you, Chair, and um, I'll send it back to you. I'm thrilled to be with you all. Thank you, Tom. We're thrilled to have you with us. Uh, the next item on the agenda is going to be the executive director's report. Susan Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and welcome, Tom, to the Green Mountain Care Board. Uh, just a couple of announcements. First, as I've been announcing for nearly a year now, we are taking uh, uh, public comments for a potential next agreement, all peer model agreement with CMMI. CMMI. Um, we have a portal on our website. I'd encourage folks to share their comments if they have any. And we do share those comments with our partners at AHS and the governor's office as they are leading the negotiations on a potential next agreement. I'd also encourage folks to check out our calendar for the month of January. And by the way, Happy New Year. Welcome 2022. Um, I don't want to steal Elena Barabee's thunder or introduction here, but I will say um, that th today is at the start of a series of meetings that we're going to be talking about um, balancing access, quality, and cost to ensure sustainability for our hospitals as we move to a value-based healthcare payment system. In addition to these discussions, on uh, January 26th, the board will conduct a certificate of need hearing on the Collaborative Surgery Center. That starts at 9 a.m. on the 26th, and that's conducted via Teams. That afternoon, we'll come back and we'll at 1 p.m. and we'll hear a presentation from our partners at DFR, Department of Financial Regulation, on the proposed updates to the Essential Health Benefits Plan. And then uh, after that, we'll hear an update from our own hospital budget team on 2023 hospital budget guidance and hospital budget guidance beyond 2023. And that is all I have to announce. I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Susan. The next item on the agenda are the minutes of Wednesday, December 22nd. Do I have a motion? So, so moved. moved. Second. It's been moved by member Pelham and seconded by member Holmes to approve the minutes of Wednesday, December 22nd without any additions, deletions or corrections. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 
any opposed signify by saying nay. Let the record show that the minutes uh, were passed unanimously. So. Um, we have a great uh, agenda for this afternoon, and um, I just want to say uh, before we start that. Um, Vermont is facing um, a lot of things. Um, in the healthcare system right now, we have um, the highest number of hospitalizations we've seen in the uh, last week. Um, the good news is, is that uh, no hospital has been overrun, although there are hospitals that are at full capacity and have no more room. And so fortunately, um, everyone has been working very well together. And thank you to our hospital leaders for the outstanding job that they've done to make sure that Vermonters are still receiving care during this uh, very difficult uh, time in our healthcare history. With that being said, today's meeting um, is a way for us to um, talk about uh, what the future might hold and actually to learn some lessons from the past. And so without giving too much away, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Elena Barabee, um, who is our strategic health policy advisor and who has put together this outstanding panel for this afternoon. So Elena, whenever you're ready, you can take it away. Great. Thank you, Chair Mullen. Um, I will share just two very brief slides. <clears throat> So first, I, I want to underscore um, some of the comments that um, you just made and, and recognize the historic challenges face, facing hospitals at this moment in time. Um, workforce challenges are real. Um, they're getting worse every day as physicians, nurses, and health service staff are experiencing burnout at a rate they've never experienced before. You know, so while COVID relief funds paid to providers have been instrumental in offsetting increased expenditures and revenue losses experienced by providers earlier in the pandemic, these financial challenges faced by hospitals um, are no, by no means fixed. Um, so with most, if not all of Vermont providers still largely operating in a volume based fee for service paradigm. So, you know, while it's clear that many voices that we need here at the table today are unable to join us as they're on the front lines of the pandemic, we must continue this conversation and keep a seat for them to join us when they're able. Each day we kick the can down the road is another day that healthcare becomes more unaffordable and our healthcare system becomes more unstable. So now is the time to develop a plan for solving these serious challenges of hospital sustainability, healthcare affordability, and equity. So it's clear that those that will be harmed most by doing nothing are those Vermonters who live in the most rural communities and those that continue to be un and underinsured. So with that said, we've invited this panel of great leaders in healthcare reform to speak with us today about their thoughts on these seminal challenges, lessons learned from the ongoing pandemic and ideas for the state of Vermont to consider as we move forward and build a more resilient and equitable system. So we're thankful to our federal, state and health system partners that were able to join us today. And we look forward to discussions and hearing your thoughts on these important issues now and as the conversation continues. So the agenda for today. So taking care of the introduction, but I will go um, introduce each speaker in turn in more detail. Um, you know, I'll kick it off for a board conversation at the end um, and then public comment and introduce some homework for January 19th. But today we'll be hearing um, and hopefully spending most of our time with um, first Dr. David Goodman, um, who will be discussing capacity um, is capacity destiny. Um, Elliot Fisher um, from Dartmouth Institute as well on healthcare reform. Where do we want to go and how can we get there? Um, Michael H. Baylett of Baylett Health, um, who will be discussing a path to hospital sustainability, healthcare affordability in Vermont. Um, and Dr. Bruce Hamry um, from Oliver Wyman, uh, Vermont Hospital Sustainability and Implementing Value-Based Care. So with that, I will introduce our first speaker, Dr. David Goodman. So Dr. David Goodman, welcome. Um, as I mentioned, uh, Dr. Goodman is from the Dartmouth Institute for Health Policy and Clinical Practice. Uh, for the past 30 years, um, Dr. Goodman has studied the causes and consequences of healthcare variation. His current research is directed towards unwarranted variation in the use of neonatal intensive care services. He was a founding investigator of the Dartmouth Atlas of Healthcare and a co-principal investigator for over a decade. He has led multiple Atlas projects on such topics as the physician workforce, end of life 
palliative cancer care, post-hospital discharge utilization, and care for infants and children. His studies have been published in the New England Journal of Medicine, JAMA, Health Affairs, Pediatrics, and the New York Times. He has also served on editorial boards of journals um, Health Services Research, Pediatrics, the Journal of Pediatrics. His teaching focuses on advancing knowledge and methods in medical care epidemiology and in evaluating children's medical care. Dr. Goodman has been a member of numerous national and international advisory committees and was the recent chair of the U.S. Council on Graduate Medical Education and with his colleague, Professor Gwyn Bevan of London School of Economics, co-founded the Wenberg International Collaboration in 2010 with the goal of accelerating population-based measurement of healthcare in OECD countries. So Dr. Goodman, I will pass the screen sharing over to you. Great. Well, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, and <laughs> now let's see if I can uh, make this magic work. Can you see that? We can. Yes. This is a miracle. OK, so let me get started uh, again. Uh, thank you for the introduction and for this opportunity to to share some of my work and you know, work of, I would say, many colleagues as well. So is capacity destiny? Uh, when I refer to capacity, uh, you know, for those who aren't familiar with that term, more specifically, you, you might think of it as supply. That is supply of clinicians, uh, physicians, advanced practice nurses, uh, PAs, and other healthcare workers, and then uh, the you know bricks and mortar manifestation of of capital investment, medical and surgical beds, ICU beds, NICU beds, and so forth. And the questions that I'm going to address today in a very short period of time is uh, number one is is how is capacity distributed? Is it distributed rationally? How does variation in capacity relate to healthcare use? And does this variation in capacity lead to unwarranted variation? That is, uh, is the healthcare variation unrelated to patient needs and preferences? And then how is capacity associated with outcomes? So this is really a synopsis of, of many studies um, uh, and, and many studies that I can present today um, by myself and my colleagues, principally at Dartmouth. So how uh, is capacity distributed? Well, I think it's no surprise, particularly when I put up a map of adult primary care physicians. Uh, this is now measured at the level of primary care service areas, which are obviously these very small uh, markets of primary care. And we look at the map and we can see, yes, indeed, uh, it varies. And your eye will be caught by the light uh, yellow, the light tan here. Uh, be, you'll be concerned that there is a possibility of underservice there, and, and that is true. And of course, there are many regions of the U.S. where there's an uh, uh, undercapacity of primary care physicians. But what I'd like to point out today is that most of the variation in primary care physician supply, and in fact, physician supply in general, is beyond the threshold of underservice. So this is a very important topic in terms of how to get to physicians into serving certain populations and into certain regions. But we need to keep in mind that that's a very specific issue. We'll talk about that a little bit, but that there is this tremendous variation above that. The distribution of capacity in general is not related uh, to patient needs at a, at a population level. It's easiest to measure physicians. I'm going to use that as my specific examples today. Let's take, for example, the example of cardiologists. So this is a per capita supply. This is now number of cardiologists per thousand Medicare enrollees across 200 and rather 306 Dartmouth Atlas regions. And you can see that there are big differences in these regions. Uh, these are all, by the way, regions of tertiary care from rather low to relatively high. Um, or I should say rather low to relatively high. Um, on the x-axis is the, uh, the rate of acute myocardial infarction uh, hospitalization per thousand Medicare enrollees. Uh, and the point is, is that there's really no relationship between the two. So that uh, risk, cardiovascular risk and disease varies a lot. The supply of cardiologists varies a lot, but they're not, uh, they're not related to the two. They're not related to each other. Moving away from uh, an elderly population now to the newborn population, 
this is a population where we can measure risk very, very precisely. Uh, and for example, this is now measuring low birth weight rates across 246 neonatal intensive care regions. And Vermont would be down here. Vermont has a very low uh, rate of low birth weight births. Uh, places like Baltimore, Louisiana are up here. Big differences across the country. Socioeconomic risk also varies a lot. This is low educational attainment and there are big differences across the country. And this is closely associated, by the way, with maternal and newborn outcomes. But if we look at capacity of NICU beds per birth, again, a lot of variation, but no relationship between, um, between needs. So the regions with higher perinatal risk, and not just risk, but higher perinatal specific needs in terms of illness levels are not the places in this country where you find higher number of NICU beds or a higher number of, of neonatologists, I should say. And this is generally true. It's true for a medical specialist. We've, we've looked at a variety of medical specialists. For primary care physicians, it is also true with the exception of family medicine where there's a weak association of family medicine, a positive association, I should say, of family medicine and socioeconomic risk. Uh, not health status, but socioeconomic risk. Advanced practice nurses tend to be distributed. Their distribution tends to correlate with physicians. Although there are obviously exceptions to this, it can be critically important in, uh, in health profession shortage areas, medically underserved areas. But in general, most advanced practice nurses are not practicing in those areas and they tend to uh, distribute where physicians do. Hospital capital investments, this is beds of all types, and I'll, I'll show you some of this. These, again, don't distribute in accordance with need. Next question I'm going to address is, does more, uh, util more capacity lead to uh, more utilization? And the answer, you're not going to be surprised by this, is, is generally uh, yes. I mean, generally, capacity uh, gets used up to the limits of its capacity. So, for example, if we go back to the number of cardiologists across those regions, and look at the number of visits um, per beneficiary, um, we see that there's a, a strong correlation, places with more cardiologists, um, uh, more visits, even though the cardiologists are not distributed in the regions, uh, not preferentially distributed in regions uh, with higher cardiovascular risk as represented by acute myocardial infections, uh, infarctions rather. Looking now uh, at medical discharges, uh, acute care beds per thousand. Again, we can see this uh, this wide distribution correlation between that and uh, all medical discharges. Uh, this is medical discharges for things like congestive heart failure, pneumonia, um, uh, uh, and other these conditions where uh, there's a lot of variation in the way that these uh, patients are cared for and in the probability they are admitted to a hospital in a particular market um, uh, for conditions for which the diagnosis is certain that there's you know this consensus in, in what the diagnosis is like hip fracture and where there's a consensus that all of those patients or essentially all those patients ought to be admitted to the hospital we find that uh, that there's no association uh, with capacity uh, patients for which there's a consensus they all need to be admitted, they definitely get into hospitals. Um, capacity operates across uh, particularly medical admissions, which are generally seen as being discretionary in that some places are able to care for those patients in a way that they are less likely to come into the hospital. Uh, in, a, in other places, uh, the probability of coming to the hospital, even with the same illness level, is much higher. So now what about this notion that, that uh, of, of utilization that may not be needed or wanted or what we term unwarranted variation? Uh, so I've already pointed out that capacity is associated with utilization. And now I'm gonna go back to the newborns. This is a study that we're doing in uh, Texas, looking at Texas Medicaid newborns. And again, this is a unique population because we have these very, very precise measurements of all of health status and health risk in all 1.1 uh, 1, um, million newborns. Uh, this is now looking at the care they're receiving across 
the 50 largest hospitals in the state of Texas. This is very low birth weight newborns. These newborns are all sick. A lot of them are very, very sick. This is looking at the number of special care days uh, that they receive. You can think of them as a the number of NICU days. The average number of NICU days is 58. So they need and, and they do spend a lot of time in the hospital and that's very, very beneficial for them. These measures now, these sort of relative rates of the number of special care days are highly risk adjusted in a way that we can do, again, so much better than we can do with Medicare beneficiaries because of this precise individual level information that we have. And it shows that from hospital to hospital, there are big differences in how many days uh, these newborns uh, spend in the hospital. Now, you might ask if there's benefit in being here or if there's harm being here. And I'm gonna address that question in, in a couple of minutes. Before that, I'm gonna show you for a, a much less sick group of no, newborns, uh, late preterm newborns, these are 34 to 36 weeks gestation. On average, they spend about four or five days in a NICU. But again, depending upon where they're admitted, there are these huge differences. Now, NICU care is a critically valuable, uh, important service. It's also a very, very expensive service. It's, it's, it's uh, a baby who's admitted to a NICU for a commercial payer is a single most expensive hospital episode, more expensive than orthopedic care, than cancer care. So this is a, a place of great concentration of resources that in general is quite beneficial um, for newborns. Um, but but you have to wonder what's going on here when you see this variation, whether there might be opportunities to reduce newborns exposure to, to time and NICUs and to save money. So when we think about uh, this question or try to address it is more better, we rely upon this theoretical construct, which is I think obvious, but I, I, I do wanna give my thanks to Elliot Fisher and to other colleagues who worked with Elliot in really doing, laying down the theoretical framework in healthcare um, for this discussion. And so uh, bear with me, but you can see that, that obviously there's a point with capacity where um, it, if you add additional capacity, patients will benefit. There's, this is a steep part of the curve. Uh, there's also, at least theoretically, a point where it begins to level off, where additional uh, capacity doesn't give quite as much benefit. And, uh, and then one reaches a certain point where if it makes no difference to be this level of capacity, no advantage to be this level of capacity compared to this, then, well, this is the efficiency benchmark. I mean, you're, you're just wasting resources uh, if you're over here. And, and one can certainly, I think, make the argument that like all good things in life, like sunshine and food uh, and fresh air that an exercise, that there's a point where what is generally good can be quite harmful. Uh, and so we also have to consider that, that uh, too much capacity or healthcare can be harmful as well. So primary care and health profession shortage areas has been empirically demonstrated to be on this part of the slope of the curve. That is you add more resources to these sites and the population as a whole will benefit. And that's the basis of, of a number of really laudable um, public programs. Primary care outside of these regions are more along this part of the curve. So there's a little bit of detectable benefit. David, I think you may have muted yourself. I could hear um, him. Can you hear me now? Can anybody else hear him? Yes. I can hear yes. Him. Okay. Uh, I, I, okay, let's, let's try it again. Okay. 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 No one has ever accused me of being too quiet, but. <laughs> okay, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, all right. Uh, if we look at a uh, neonatologist or hospital capacity, there's good evidence that, uh, that by and large, uh, there are exceptions to this and particularly in, in uh, some, some, I would say probably some regions in, in Vermont, but generally uh, hospital capacity is operating in this realm of inefficiency. So does more care always benefit 
um, patients? The answer is no. And I'm going to return back to those newborns in those hospitals in the state of Texas. You recall that for very low birth weight babies, the number of special care days they spent in the hospitals varied a lot. So these are those hospitals. The bigger hospitals have bigger dots, the littler hospitals, little dots. And what we're looking at now is the association of the number of days on average that these babies are spending in the hospital with 30-day adverse events. These include mortality, readmission, and emergency room visit. So these are very sensitive indicators of things not going well for a baby or things not going well at home for a newborn. This is 30 days after discharge. And there is no evidence that the babies that are discharged from the hospitals, which on average they spend less time in the NICU, that they have more adverse events on average. Doesn't mean that there aren't some babies who get home, who get sent home too soon. I mean, this can always happen, and there are some babies who are held back too long. But we can see that, th that this practice style uh, in these hospitals, there's no signal of adverse events. And if we look at the less sick cohort, the late preterm newborn cohorts, it's the same, the same phenomenon, no evidence of harm. Now, that's looking at the newborns. Let's go back and look at uh, the elderly. So one way of addressing this question is more better is to standardize the outcome. So let's, instead of uh, looking at the relationship between say capacity or utilization and outcomes, let's fix the outcome and then see the different patterns of, of use or different patterns of capacity. And we have done this and, and Elliot's gonna, I know refer to this uh, study design as well. He's done much of the work in developing it is to take a group of Medicare beneficiaries who have chronic illness and who have died. And then to look at their care in the last six months of life. These uh, individuals can be assigned to hospitals on the basis of where they're receiving most of their inpatient care in the last six months of life. And we're able to measure, in this case, what we're measuring is clinical physician labor input. That is the clinical FTEs. This is measured through looking at um, professional claims, CPT codes associated with work RVUs, knowing the number of average work RVUs per internist, per cardiac surgeon, you know, per rheumatologist, and calculating um, the, the uh, clinical FTEs. And we can see that NYU Medical Center, this cohort on average, they die at about 82 years of age, and they receive 28 FTEs per thousand of these beneficiaries in the last six months of life. Primary care, 8.8, .8, medical specialist, 15. Now I'll draw your attention to the Mayo Clinic in Rochester. The average age of death is just about the same, 8.9 FTEs, less primary care. So there's no substitution here, less primary care, less medical specialists. Healthcare systems unknowingly typically are very adaptable uh, at using, you know, high uh, amounts of capacity uh, that's available to them in their environment. They're very adaptable uh, uh, in evolving healthcare systems. They're able to deliver very, very good care uh, with low capacity a as well. A different study uh, that Dr. Fisher and I uh, collaborated on um, looking uh, at this issue from a uh, patient's perspective. Uh, this now takes uh, physicians per capita, uh, per, per capita across the Dartmouth Atlas hospital referral regions. We, defi we divide those regions into uh, quintiles, the lowest quintile, the highest. You can see that the highest quintile on average now has 60% more physicians per capita. And this can be done, and we have done it for both primary care and specialists. And by the way, the findings are quite similar. Looking at technical quality now, acute MIs, congestive heart failure, pneumonia, is essentially no difference in technical quality related to physician per capita capacity. There are slight differences, but these are slight, particularly when you consider that, you know, rather light touch interventions in these places can definitely alter favorably these uh, technical quality scores. Um, increasing physician capacity to like the highest quintile across the whole US 
uh, you couldn't think of any intervention that could be possibly more expensive or difficult to achieve and for not really uh, any benefit. From the standpoint of the Medicare beneficiaries, ever had a problem and didn't see a doctor? Do you have a particular place for medical care? Satisfied with the ease of getting to the doctor? Satisfied with doctors concerned for overall health? Satisfied with quality of medical care? Capacity is not important. And it's not to say what doctors do is not important, I think what this says is that what doctors do is very important. The number of doctors that happen to be in a region is much, much less important to the way the care is organized and it's delivered and, 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 and the quality of that care. Now, I'm going to give a cautionary note and then I'm going to uh, end up with, with talking about some ways uh, that, that different jurisdictions have, have tried to wrestle with this problem. This is a tough problem, and to demonstrate that, I'm going to go to the most centrally planned and organized healthcare system, arguably in the world, which is the English NHS. Uh, and this shows measurements across these regions called primary care trusts. They were used during this time period as a way of both measuring and organizing and funding care, not just primary care, but also secondary and tertiary care. Um, the, the Brits have a, a long history of measuring what they call deprivation in small areas. Uh, one of those, the component, one of the components of the deprivation index, and it's one of the most important components, is early mortality. So this is mortality rates in those under age 65. I mean, obviously, this is an age where one ought not to ought to die. And you know, England is like the U.S. I mean, there are great disparities across uh, regions in terms of socioeconomic um, uh, risk as well as actual health outcomes. And what they do in the NHS is they fund in accordance with deprivation index. It's very intentional. Places with higher depriv deprivation indices get more money. Now we're going to look at the supply of general practitioners, the primary care physicians. Okay. And we're doing this by looking at their patient list. So every patient has to register with a primary care doctor and list size can be seen as you, if you measure list size, then you have a, a, a very precise way of measuring the number of, of physicians caring for a particular population in a region. And this is what primary care supply looks like in England. It's as irrational as it is in the US. You say, well, why is that? Well, the GPs are, they're not employed by the NHS. They are independent practices. They are contractors. They're vendors, if you will, for the NHS. Their, their contracts are negotiated by British, British Medical Association, but they have great flexibility in how they organize their practices and where they settle. So even in this very planned economy, healthcare economy, we have, uh, we have these problems. So what are some of the responses to under and over capacity? Well, this is a really interesting uh, report to look at from this New York State Commission on Healthcare Facilities in the 21st Century. New York State looked as, at itself at a state level and concluded what health services researchers certainly concluded a long time ago, which is that it was an overbedded state and that it was driving irrational care and very expensive care. And they constructed a commission that they tried to devise it so it would be relatively politically and lobbying immune, um, you know, to uh, you know for the decisions and the recommendations that they made. That, that once this committee made the decisions, that there would be um, action on the ground. And they identified regions uh, of of over, uh, you know, where there was a high bed supply, and facilities that they thought. Um, ought to be closed for a variety of reasons, and this would help to reduce capacity. They were partially successful. You may recall that there was a hospital in lower Manhattan that uh, on the basis of this, um, uh, this commission, uh, that hospital closed down. It caused you know, a local uh, commotion, but it was closed down. On the other hand, Syracuse, New York, where I went to medical school, Krauss Irving Hospital is adjacent and connected to the university hospital, and Krauss Irving long time after I graduated, was identified as a hospital that was redundant in a service sense and in a capacity sense 
uh, and, uh, and, and they're still in business today. It's tough stuff taking away capacity, which means it's even more important to be very wise and careful about adding capacity. Numerous states, of course, and uh, the federal government, but I want to point out states because, um, because I'm talking to a state now, and there are states that have been very uh, energetic and active in their incentives and subsidies for sustaining primary care, both through uh, uh, funding training programs and also for subsidization of practices. Um, primary care and other marginalized services. These communities um, need directed investments. This is where the, you know, uh, the marketplace, uh, there's failure all over, but this is where the worst failures are manifest. Now, there are other countries who do this differently, and that is that they ignore capacity, but they don't ignore the effects of capacity. And so one way of handling this is saying, well, at least we're not going to go bankrupt from this. And so they use their uniform fee schedule simply to turn down price. So when overcapacity or overenthusiasm on the part of the providers lead to high levels of utilization that's not in the public interest, the prices decrease. Now you can say, well, that's going to increase volume, and it does to some extent. But by and large, of course, these countries have uh, the percent of their GDP that goes to healthcare is a little bit over half of what it is in the U.S. And they have much better outcomes. And although you can say, well, Japan is a very homogeneous country, no one can say that Germany is today with the immigrant population. So these are, in Germany in particular, is becoming a diverse country with a lot of the same challenges that we have in the U.S. Numerous countries have, this is not what they call them, but they're essentially capacity commissions that provide not, you know, one snapshot, but ongoing surveillance of the different dimensions of capacity, monitoring their, their, both their manifestation and their consequences, and then promoting policies. These commissions us usually are not delegated the authority to intervene, but their recommendations are taken very, very seriously, both in terms of um, who gets trained or where public funding goes for training, uh, and also how public funding is used for, you know, for shaping um, investments into, into capacity and uh, an organization of care. Capitation, uh, in theory, if, if capitation was linked with meaningful measurement-based accountability, uh, then one could argue that, uh, that those firms or those regions would on their own, they would rationalize capacity. Because it's very clear what the goals are uh, in, in terms of outcomes, they are measured by it, they are incentivized um, by it, uh, and then that uh, would lead to um, more appropriate investments. And, and you, do, you can see this in, in uh, prepaid group practices like Kaiser Permanente. I mean, Kaiser Permanente does not have excess capacity in NICU care, and they have great outcomes, risk-adjusted outcomes. Uh, and there are many, many, you know, examples of that. And it's hard to achieve, but um, but it's good to keep that in mind. So is capacity destiny? Well, the way I think of it is that it's not destiny, but levels of capacity are strong and typically invisible currents. Most healthcare systems don't know what their level of capacity is, and yet, um, those currents, uh, those health systems are unknowingly rowing with or against that current. So you reduce readmission rates in a place where bed supply is high. And what happens to that empty bed? It doesn't, it doesn't get closed. It gets filled. It gets filled. And, and with what patient? And there is evidence that maybe not all those beds, but a high proportion of those beds get filled with a discretionary admission. The same admission that in another place with lower level capacity would be cared for outside the hospital just as well. And then finally, I'm gonna leave you with this, which is um, it's a reminder to myself, not to you, um, as, as someone who tries to ask questions, 
is this continual struggle in healthcare. Are, are, are we asking the right questions? And you can look at this here. This, I mean, this could be in Vermont, although it's in upstate New York. But here you have this autumnal scene, this fellow who is a firefighter who's staring at the pumpkins here. And, uh, and he is thinking about something. But he sure isn't thinking about the right thing. And this is a this is a, a challenge, I think, to all of us. And I will leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Goodman. Um, and so we'll hold all substantive questions to the end and I'll present or I'll um, introduce our next speaker unless there are any clarifying questions from the board. But I will assume you will have asked those. OK, um, so next we'll have Dr. Elliot Fisher. Um, so Elliot Fisher is a professor of health policy and medicine um, and community and family medicine at the Dartmouth Institute and the Geisel School of Medicine. His research focuses on exploring the causes and consequences of regional and provider specific differences in spending and quality, and more recently on developing policy approaches to slowing the growth of spending while improving quality. He was one of the originators of the concept of the Accountable Care Organization, or ACOs, led the research that demonstrated the feasibility of the approach and worked with Mark McClellan, now of the uh, Margolis Institute, to achieve their inclusion in the Affordable Care Act. His current research is focused on exploring the policy and organizational factors that influence health system performance in the U.S. Um, and what can be done to reduce costs, improve health, and improve care. He received his undergraduate and medical degrees from Harvard, his MPH from the University of Washington, and advanced training in negotiation at Harvard Law School. He serves on the board of the Fannie E. Ripple Foundation and helped design and launch their first flagship initiative, Rethink Health, and he published over 200 research articles and commentaries and is a member of the National Academy of Medicine. So welcome and thank you, Dr. Fisher. Hey, great. Can, can you guys hear me at all or... That's the first miracle. Now, the second thing we'll try to do is see if I can share my screen appropriately. And with any luck, let's see, I gotta bring you guys back up somehow. Can you see that screen, by the way? We can, yes. Uh, let's see, there we are. All right, now I can both see you and the screen and now I'll start the presentation and then lordy lordy, we'll be on our way. Oh, God. Don't you guys love the love teaching in Zoom or doing stuff in Zoom? First, thank you so much for having me. It's really an honor to be here, you know, see some former students um, and colleagues trying to make the world a better place for the people who live here. Um, I also thrilled to be able to follow David, who has done so much of the remarkable work about the importance of capacity so directly related to the sustainability challenge. Um, that the hospitals are facing. Um, I'm going to pivot a little bit um, to try to think about where we might go from here. But I'm going to, going to, I'm going to both touch on some health services research, um, but also talk about you know, what I've learned about negotiation from many years um, and some advanced study at Harvard Law School. So here we go. Um, Here's your charge, um, which I think I can, I've summarized in the bold terms on the, on the right. You know, better health, lower cost, better care, a great workforce, simpler. Um, and I know, you know, given COVID-19 and what it's revealed about disparities, equity is for all of us also and a really important priority, and if, whether it's in for various kinds of disadvantaged populations. Um, the challenge, of course, is that it's really hard to do. You know, the biggest challenge facing American healthcare is rising healthcare costs. Um, it doesn't help to increase somebody's deductible. They're going to have to pay it. Financial toxicity is one of the most broad. You know, more than half of the American public reports that they're harmed by the the costs of healthcare um, directly upon them, and yet it is almost impossible for us to make meaningful progress except in ex remarkable circumstances. Uh, so what I wanna to touch on is what I think are a few barriers to getting there. You know, why is it so hard? First, pessimism. Uh, we feel, you know, it, it's inexorable. He rising healthcare costs is like the tides. We're not gonna do anything about it. What about population? 
population health, it's impossible. So we tend to be fairly discouraged. Um, a second reason is we ignore the weight where the waste is, and David has pointed us in some of those directions. Um, we have a fragmented system, and I'll, that's really what I think is the major barrier um, to improving the value of care in our system. And finally, policy change is really hard. You know, it's like there are plenty of people who don't want to change. So let's um, look at what's possible. I, you know, I, I've been privileged over the last 10 years to be involved with Rethink Health, which is an, uh, the flagship initiative of the Ripple Foundation. Um, when we launched it, one of the things um, we realized we needed to do was try to gain some insights into what is happening um, in the healthcare system. What are the factors that drive um, better health, better care, lower costs? What are the policy interventions that might make a difference? Working with you know some of the leading systems modelers in the country, um, we developed some simulations in 11 local places. Um, and, you know, it's a complicated model. There's lots of math behind this. But the idea is, based on the best possible evidence, we could test interventions um, in combination to see what would happen um, if we um, tweaked the system. Over the next 20 to 30 years, what would happen to costs? What would happen to disadvantage? Uh, and you know, we, we published one of the papers that showed what's potentially possible. I suspect Robin, if she's there, I mean, I'm supposed to say board member lunch. What am I supposed to say? Um, um, has worked with the model when she was at MHCDS. Um, but what, what we found was really, you know, in some ways exciting for those of us who want to be, who are optimists about the healthcare system. Now, uh, the key elements of the strategy, not surprisingly, reduce modifiable health risks, get people to, you know, in, an, in other work with a team from University of Washington, we showed that, you know, reducing modifiable health risks would increase American life expectancy by 10 years. Um, adopt global payment models, support and spread innovations and improvements in care delivery. Address the truly upstream health determinants like socioeconomic um, disadvantage and early childhood education and lack of labor force involvement. And then the trick to the model is that you figure out a way to capture the savings so that you can reinvest the savings to fully fund the cost of those extraordinarily expensive um, um, initiatives, which I just presented. But the results are pretty impressive. Oops, so let's see if I can go backwards one. You know, when you, when you um, implement the model, um, you can reduce total per capita health care costs over the next 20 years, um, 25 years, by 15%. You can reduce the prevalence of severe chronic illness by 20%. Um, you can increase the income of the employed population by 9%. That's the biggest number. What you've done is you've produced a, a, a healthy workforce. If we look, think about Vermont and our efforts to recruit people from out of state, well, what if instead we decided we're, or in addition, perhaps, not to criticize the governor, um, in addition, perhaps, we decide we're going to invest in creating a healthy population so that they are able to work. Um, and finally, we're concerned about equity and the disadvantaged proportion of the population falls by 20 percent because they're, they're now able to make a decent living. The second reason we aren't making progress, I believe, is that we ignore where the waste is. You know, Don Berwick and, oh, I forget the first name of the sec his second author, um, in 2012 published an article estimating the magnitude of U.S. health, a waste in U.S. healthcare. A second, more recent article um, by William Schrank came up to essentially, with essentially the same conclusions. There's huge amounts of waste in American healthcare. Some of them are obvious. Um, and I'll mention one of those, but I, the ones I want to focus on are really the first three. Um, failures of care delivery, failures of care coordination, and overtreatment, which together I think are a serious problem. Um, the mistake is that we, especially those of us trained as doctors, tend to have a narrow focus on specific treatments, on biomedicine. I was trained to think about how to treat blood pressure. Um, this is the focus of medical education, and, and we need it. It's how you deliver care that keeps people healthy and safe. Um, the challenge is that 
Um, oh, here's oh, yes, I forgot. I was going to tell you an example. I love it. Um, how many of you are familiar with uh, choosing wisely? I, I see a couple of hands raised. You know, at least a few of you are nodding. Others of you are looking puzzled. Anyway, it's it's a wonderful effort. I was at the meeting of the ABIM Foundation where we came up with this idea. Um, let's get people to pay attention to low value tests, procedures, and drugs. Um, and that will reduce harm and cost. There are now over 80 specialty <laughs> partners involved. There are 520 recommendations. Everybody's buying into this. So question, how, how much money is on the table? Well, a wonderful study you know, from just about a year ago looked at this carefully in the Medicare population. And you know, they found that about 36% of enrollees were receiving some low value care. Well, that's bad. There's a lot of harm, potential harm there from getting that done. Um, but the spending on low value care, it was $50, $52 per person. Now, there's been a huge campaign and they saved $6 per enrollee over the, over the four years by reducing. Now, there are all sorts of assumptions under there. The key point is about that, that dollar amount, $52, $40, $46. It's not much money. Uh, who knows who that's a picture of? I can make it bigger if you want. He's famously said, go where the money is. All right, unmute, I wanna hear. He's a famous bank robber. Bank robber. Right. Sutton. Dillinger. Billy Sutton, Sutton's Sutton. Law, exactly. So we, we're not going where the money is. And there are two places where the money is that I want us to pay attention to. Uh, the first is this this notion of care delivery. It's really the supply sensitive discretionary care that David already referred to. It's not what treatment, it's not what the biology is, it's where, by whom, and how often treatment is given. It's something we don't think about. I was never trained when to see the next patient for high blood pressure, but in some other studies we did, we know that the, how frequently the same patients are seen for high blood pressure across the country varies by a factor of 12. You ask some doctors in Oregon, when would you see the next patient with well, your patient with well-controlled high blood pressure? They say in six months or a year. In Miami and McAllen, Texas, they say every month. You know, the site of care is similar, by whom they're seen, how often, um, this is, you know, what David pointed us to. That is, there's lots of care that's not biologically driven. It's driven by the way we think about delivering care. And one insight we've learned from COVID, the disaster that has been COVID, um, is that innovations in care delivery can mean we can deliver care in all sorts of different ways. We have ICUs built in parking lots and patients seen by telephone. Um, I, I was really lucky to have been given gazillion dollars by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to look at this at a national level in the Medicare population. Um, and this is a sub-study sub um, because the initial studies were criticized because we looked at the whole population and found 20 or 30 percent savings because there's a lot of waste in the low spending regions compared to the high spending regions. And then all the academic medical centers said, no, 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 you're not looking at the best hospitals in the United States. You're looking at everybody and maybe it's because there's lousy care. So we did another study which looked at the subset of best hospitals in the, America, in, in the United States, the top 300 members of the Council of Teaching Hospitals. And then they complained still, and we looked at the top 100 academic medical centers, all the same findings, which I'll share with you now. The first thing is we studied patients with heart attack, hip fracture, and colon cancer because they had similar baseline risk everywhere in the country. Um, it would provide insights into the quality and outcomes of care for three service lines, um, orthopedics, cardiology, and oncology. And if we find patterns consistent across those service lines and diagnoses, it'll reveal shared attributes of what the healthcare system is. And they were measured, grouped according to regional intensity. And David's already shown you how they treat people at the end of life. It, it's a travesty. I had, to, I had to go give a talk at Langone after we did that study um, and talk to them about how much they cost. Anyway, what we found um, is if you look in the first six months where everyone's been hospitalized, 
um, the spending differences are pretty substantial. In the highest group, in the highest intensity hospitals, the differences for heart attack were about 600 bucks per person, 600 bucks for colon cancer, and about 730 for, per patient in those first six months. But if you look at patients over the following six months to two, five years, and they get all their care at these hospitals, right? There's loyalty to these hospitals. We know that because we measured it. Um, the differences per person are per year are incredible. So you can reduce the, this study, the national study, um, because we found that outcomes were no better, quality was no better, access to care was no better by any measures we had. This was the, these were the findings that ended up putting me on the road to talk about the possibility of saving 20 to 30 percent of U.S. healthcare spending if we could learn how to adopt the, the practices of the lower spending regions. Time-wise, not too bad. Another place where waste is common, and that's high prices, and you all know that. This is just a figure from Kaiser Family Foundation looking, you know, comparing the Baltimore region where the average in-network charge is $23,000 for a joint replacement, and it's $60,000 in New York. Uh, pricing power is a clear problem. States that decide they're going to do something about it, such as Maryland, can do better. Now, Turning to my more recent frustration with why I've made no progress after deciding at, at, you know, at age 23 to go into medicine to try to reduce the cost and improve care for disadvantaged populations, um, I think that the challenge is that we have an incredibly porous system. If we try to control prices um, on the public side, and we know this, providers can raise prices to private payers because they have market payers. We do bundled payments. Providers will shift costs out of the bundle, deliver more bundles. Oh, this is my favorite. ACOs for some patients? Oh, I thought this was going to be a nifty idea. Well, that's great. Um, you can use the ACO model to keep some of your patients in the ACO out of the hospital and fill the beds, as David was pointing out, um, with higher paying patients. If you limit the profit of health plans, they can raise premiums or lower provide lower value plans. And the, my the perhaps most egregious is think we're going to reduce costs by limiting increasing co-pays and deductibles, and we just increase discretionary care for those who've met the deductible. It's had no impact on healthcare costs, the fact that we all are now in high deductible plans. Um, so, and, you know, in Vermont, I'm afraid our poorest system is not helping with this. You know, if you've got multiple payment channels, it is easy to shift from one payment channel to another in order to increase your, maintain or increase your revenues. So in a paper I wrote for the New England Journal Catalyst um, a year ago, I think we can overcome this if we think about a global budget for the state, capitation to something I refer to there as population health organizations, but if you can imagine every you know, community in, in Vermont having a primary care focus population health organization that pays attention to both population health and great primary care to implement what we think health says we could do. You need good information to find the leaks and improve performance, and you need administrative simplification. You know, that's a single system, um, and I don't care. Single payer, regular multi-payer, you just got to figure out how to put your hands around this thing and get rid of the um, all of the administrative waste and be able to constrain um, what our providers is, providers are doing so that they now and our health plans are competing on value, not competing by shifting risks or raising prices or shifting costs to others. But can we? So I'm coming coming down the home stretch here. The underlying problem is that, you know, and I'm looking at Michael here, you know, it's really hard to change policy, you know. Um, but right now in Vermont, we have a process headed for failure. A divergent stakeholder perspectives, many of whom could easily block, block, block progress. Their current focus is on positions. You know, reading the letters that have been written to you guys, it's like, oh, don't touch hospitals. That's our position. You shouldn't be interfering at all with the hospitals. Or the Vermont Medical Association Let's just increase payments to primary care physicians. I'm not being completely fair. There's lots of good to these proposals, but let's increase payments to primary care physicians 
without mentioning that maybe we have to figure out where we're going to find the money. The decision making is structured this way. Stakeholders are largely asked to make concessions. You know, a, a representative will say, or the chair of a committee will say, you know, won't you take this behind the scenes? And, and why would you give anything up before you know what, whether other interests are being met? Um, and no one has the primary ongoing responsibility for in, inventing a creative and feasible solution. Well, if those are the diagnoses, I'm a doc, you come up with some prescriptions. You know, engage stakeholders in a process specifically designed to make them willing to support a final proposal. Explore interests and create solutions focused on the public good that meet the party's core interests. You know, in terms of decision making, encourage criticism of a working draft with no commitment. Iteratively refine it, but then present a final decision. Well, it's this or nothing. Is this better than no progress this year or is this better than some progress this year? And finally, you can't do any of that without establishing a dedicated team to manage the reform process and develop proposals that could achieve broad support and overcome the technical challenges. Might this work? Well, it has. This was the method that was, you know, that was used by um, President Carter and Cy Vance um, to, you know, through 23 different drafts uh, at Camp David and led to the Camp David Accords. And it's like almost funny. Uh, oops. Uh, much smaller scale, but it's really what Mark McClellan and I did when we tried, when over a three year time frame, we tried to take this germinal idea that came from Blue Cross Massachusetts, his own work with um, at, at Medicare for large groups, and then our, our work. Um, to try to form a team. He came up with some money from Brookings. I came up with some money from the Dartmouth Institute um, to work over a three-year time frame to gradually refine a, pro uh, refine a proposal and get it presented. Um, and, you know, it, 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 it was a pretty long process. Uh, and, you know, it ended up being included in the Affordable Care Act and the rest of you are suffering the consequences of our success. Um, so next. Sunday, if you were listening to Krista Tippett, Desmond Tutu said about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, reconciliation is a process. It's not something that is just an event. And I want us to sort of remember that as we think about healthcare reform. It's not a product, it's a process. And so I think we should invest in the work, in what we need to do, um, or I hope you will think about investing, doing the work in what, yeah, we gotta get back to advance my screen. Might this work here? Well, I think we should think about establishing such a process and it might look something like this. You know, there's a dedicated team uh, that, identifies interests, invent options, develops draft proposals, reviews them and refines them and present yes or propositions. They're gonna to have to do that with all of these content experts um, and in consultation um, with all of the stakeholders and decision makers. What are their interests? Why are they, you know, what's not addressed in this draft? How would, and you don't have them tell you how to revise it. You have them tell you why they don't like it, which gives you insights into what they might better be able to like. So to sum up, uh, we all know the challenges we face. It's a total mess. The barrier, if the barrier is pessimism, create a shared vision of what's possible and perhaps do that by convening a multi-stakeholder group here in Vermont using the Rethink Health model. We facilitated um, sessions all over the country. We could do it again here. We ignore where the waste is. So we need to broaden our perspectives on the opportunities and improve. And I think the model can help there as well. In terms of a fragmented system, I, you know, I do our best to think about moving toward a single system um, that can improve health care and costs while eliminating cost shifts. And that's going to require data. I didn't talk much about data, but I know that you, know, you all are worried, the board is worried about it. Um, but we, we're probably in as good a position as any place in the country with the HIE and the all-payer data um, if augmented 
uh, to really be able to measure performance well with meaningful clinical data, population health risks. And then if the underlying barrier is a focus on solution with each party thinking they're right and pushing their ideas, let's shift toward a reform process for the long haul that serves up the best feasible solutions. And then seek some expert guidance. So I wanna wrap up there. I apologize for something of a sermon. My great grandfather um, was a Presbyterian lay preacher um, known throughout Asia and the United States as Roaring Robbie. Um, so I, I come by my um, preacherly attitude legitimately. Anyway, thank you. I look forward to any questions and I'll figure out how to stop, sh to stop sharing. Uh, thank you. Great. Away? Oh, phew, did that work? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fisher. Um, so now we'll hear from Michael Baylett, who will focus more on the policy um, approach. Um, so Michael Baylett, um, MBA president of Baylett Health, founded Baylett Health in 1997 and has since worked with a wide array of state agencies and employer purchasing coalitions in over 30 states, including Vermont. Uh, Michael's professional interests focus on how purchasers and regulators can influence healthcare <laughs> markets to operate as efficiently and effectively as possible. Michael's worked with clients on affordability strategies, payment and delivery system reform, including ACO, medical home and episode-based payment strategy design and implementation, performance measurement and value-based purchasing, and multi-stakeholder change process guidance and facilitation. In addition to assisting state and multi-stakeholder efforts, Michael has also authored many reports and briefs on payment reform. Prior to founding Baylet Health, Michael served as Assistant Commissioner for Benefit Plans in the Massachusetts Division of Medical Assistance in the State Medicaid Agency. His response responsibilities included the management of all of the division's benefit plans, including the HMO, behavioral health, primary care, case management, and senior care programs. Also, while with Massachusetts, Michael founded the Massachusetts Healthcare Purchaser Group and served as its chairman and president. And previously, Michael worked for Digital Equipment Corporation and was engaged in health and welfare benefit planning and management activities for digital 60,000 U.S. employees. Michael earned a Bachelor of Arts degree from Wesleyan University and an MBA from the Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern. Welcome. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Um, can you all see my slides? Yes? Great. Okay. Well, uh, good afternoon, members of the board. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to speak with you this afternoon. My plan is to summarize findings from a pair of studies that um, you all had performed for you, and then to offer to you recommendations to address your twin objectives of hospital sustainability and affordability for healthcare Vermonters. Um, I am, uh, I, I think, at times going to uh, make comments that are going to resonate with both David and Elliot's comments that you heard before me. So first, um, I want to uh, briefly uh, summarize uh, two studies that you had commissioned, one by the Berkeley Research Group um, looking at hospital quality and capacity, and one by Health Management Associates on payment and cost coverage variation. Uh, and uh, I'm going to summarize uh, just um, six um, observations from their studies. First, um, they observed, and I want to note that everything that they did was pre-COVID, uh, and uh, and I want to note that Vermont's hospitals right now are going through a particularly stressful period um, due to the um, Omicron surge. So all this data, um, uh, or almost all of it, uh, is pre-COVID. So what they um, found was the financial health of Vermont's hospitals, as assessed by operating margin, had declined pretty consistently over six recent fiscal years. Um, I do want to note that when viewing hospital finances, I think it's important not only to look at operating margin, but also at total margin, given the significant revenue hospitals generate through non-operating sources. But nonetheless, um, declining operating margins over time um, could lead to hospital closures, as has happened with rural hospitals across the United States. And of course, um, this is also going to harm health equity, particularly for people in rural communities. Um, two um, they observed that commercial reimbursement is significantly higher than payer, public payer payment um, and higher than the cost of delivering services. And that's linked to number three, um, which is that um, these higher commercial reimbursement rates create significant affordability problems for Vermont employers and residents. 
uh, and uh, a, a survey uh, conducted uh, by uh, Vermont, the Household Health Insurance Survey, uh, reported that for 2018, 40% of Vermonters under 65 um, reported being underinsured. Uh, and I'm guessing that percentage is much higher now. Uh, and so affordability is a problem. It's especially affordability for people with uh, lower wages. Uh, fourth, um, they observed that several Vermont hospitals operated very low occupancy, and some of them are rel uh, located relatively close to another hospital. And here are a few examples of hospitals with low occupancy rates. Uh, further projections for the Vermont population indicate that some of the hospitals are going to have even more excess capacity in the future, although there will be a few that will need to add capacity. And then finally, um, they observed that the um, prevention quality indicators, which are measures uh, created by the Federal Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, um, found uh, the composite score uh, found uh, was found to be below optimal levels. So that means that the rate of potentially avoidable admissions is higher than one would want it to be. And that might indicate an opportunity for improved community services uh, that would avoid those uh, potentially avoidable admissions. So those were six key findings that I pulled from their research. Um, and, and from there, I want to share with you some uh, recommendations as to where to go next. So I've grouped them as short term and long term. I, I struggle with this a little bit because I, I'm not I'm not sure that there's actually a sharp demarcation between them, uh, but certainly some of the short term ones are are easier to do more quickly. So the first one is to study how much commercial hospital prices are rising annually on a per capita basis and how they're contributing to overall trend. Connecticut did this recently uh, and um, and the, the findings were pretty compelling. They found between 2015 and 2019, out-of-pocket commercial spending was growing 6.5% a year. And they compared that to wage growth, and average wage growth was 2.6% a year. So that, that's, a, that's a pretty you know, gripping um, example of the impact on affordability when you've got out-of-pocket spending growing 6.5% a year and wages at about 2.5% a year. So um, this is this is not all that difficult to do. You've got an all payer claims database and you can do it using that information. And I think that provides some important contextualization for understanding the affordability problem. I think um, you can also fairly easily use the National Academy for State Health Policy's hospital cost tool uh, to better understand the finances of Vermont hospitals easily accessible. So these are shorter term things that you can do. Um, a little bit more substantive as a policy change and something that would directly address affordability in the commercial market uh, is to begin to constrain price growth in the commercial market. Um, the Green Mountain Care Board, um, I recommend you should use its regulatory processes to not only understand hospital prices, uh, but to restrict how much they can grow. Uh, and this obviously would involve a more aggressive use of your regulatory authority. Uh, but there are examples of other states that are doing this. Rhode Island for several years now has constrained hospital price growth by linking um, uh, price growth to um, uh, inflation. So they've got it at CPI plus 1%. I'm not saying that's right, but that's how they've constrained price growth. And uh, an evaluation published in Health Affairs showed that Rhode Island healthcare spending has grown more slowly than the other New England states during the period since they implemented this um, in the commercial market. Uh, and I'll note that uh, Delaware recently borrowed uh, pretty directly from Rhode Island. Rhode Island has a set of what they call affordability standards that their health insurance commissioner administers through regulation and uh, Delaware has replicated them. So this is a, a strategy that um, I would suggest for your consideration. I'll also note, because this is relevant, um, given the all-payer ACO model in the state, that Rhode Island also set a cap on how much um, commercial ACO budgets can grow from year to year. Um, and then, um, you know, be, uh, you know, harkening back to some of the, the comments you heard earlier, um, because, uh, capacity um, 
should be viewed both in across the service uh, spectrum. And because there's some indication that there are more avoidable hospitalizations in the state than are necessary, you might want to consider um, creating some requirements for increased investment in primary care capacity and maybe mental health if that's relevant. Uh, and so this is a, another concept. There are about a half dozen states that have created primary care spend targets to increase um, their primary care infrastructure. And by really, I mean to um, support and sustain it. Uh, and uh, of course, Vermont's done a lot through the blueprint for health around primary care. But at least I offer for your consideration that if you believe that there's not sufficient capacity for primary care, uh, and, and I don't just mean counts of clinicians, but I mean uh, primary care teams that can support all the needs of providers. You might consider a primary care spend target. Uh, some of the other states that have done this, uh, Rhode Island, Oregon, Connecticut, Colorado, and Pennsylvania. Uh, and I mentioned a mental health spend target because there are some states that are starting to think about this too. So these are um, some shorter term changes, some more substantive ones um, that that you know honestly are going to be more difficult to do and uh, and as Elliot noted, um, making change happen is really hard, uh, but but it's it's necessary and it can it can happen uh, in stepwise fashion. It doesn't have to be everything all at once. Um, I'm, I want to run through these uh, uh, slightly longer term or heavier lift recommendations. Um, I, I want to start also with the. Uh, um, assumption that long-term sustainability of Vermont's hospitals is intrinsically linked to long-term affordable quality care for Vermonters. So I, I think you need to think about uh, two of them at once. Uh, and I'm uh, I'm breaking down my recommendations into three categories, delivery system reform, payment reform, and public accountability. And at the end, I want to comment a little bit on um, waste, which Elliot gave a lot of focus to, and especially um, the care delivery element of waste. So um, even though these are longer term, uh, clearly to to take these actions uh, requires nearer term uh, steps, but uh, but these actions would take place over multiple years. So I, I think the Berkeley Research uh, Group analysis in pretty compelling fashion um, identifies an opportunity, if not a need, to think about redeployment of hospital resources uh, and and linking resources to community need. And while COVID-19 has showed the need for standby inpatient capacity, um, it's probably not prudent or efficient um, to maintain capacity for maximum pandemic uh, need. So. I think uh, some of the ideas to better leverage the hospital assets and, and some of these were identified uh, in Berkeley Research Group's report are to consolidate geographically redundant inpatient capacity because there appears to be some of this within the state um, and then supporting alternative services. Um, certainly the hospital at home concept is is growing. That's not the only alternative. Uh, to uh, inpatient facility capacity, but it certainly is one worthy of consideration. Um, I think maintaining existing and needed outpatient capacity at facilities is important, even if their inpatient uh, capacity is drawn down. And some of those services might be freestanding EDs and observation beds and uh, outpatient uh, mental health and substance abuse treatment. And then creating new and expanding services um, in place of the inpatient capacity where there's unmet need. And I'm thinking not just of clinical services, but also of social services as well, uh, because um, th there probably is a better way to provide services in some of the communities than to maintain um, uh, excessive inpatient capacity. Um, there are, lot, as I said, there are lots of alternative configurations for um, for where there is um, excess inpatient capacity. Some of those are listed here. I think the decision of how to do this um, needs to, um, and this connects to some of the Elliott's process recommendations, but um, needs to be heavily community driven. I think that resonates very much with the culture of the state. Uh, 
And so I think the community should identify what their future needs are in terms of services if if resources and are going to be redeployed. At the same time, I don't think it can be um, this can be decisions made individually by communities because um, many of Vermont's hospitals are in relatively close geographic proximity. So a decision made in one community is going to impact surrounding communities. Um, so this can't be community by community, even if um, it's heavily community informed, if not driven. Second category of recommendations have to do with payment reform. Uh, as Elena said, at the very outset of this meeting, uh, hospitals continue to be paid largely on a fee-for-service basis in Vermont. Um, it, that creates a financial imperative to maintain or increase service volume because it's the only way that you stay in business. Uh, but but that uh, that's inherently inflationary, and it's not really aligned with maximizing population health. Population health needs um, uh, are not linked to filled hospital beds. There has been some movement in the state to perspective budget-based hospital payment models, uh, and I would say, frankly, a lot more than in most states, but it simply has not been enough. Um, Vermont's hospitals are receiving um, too small a percentage of their payments through prospective budgets, and sometimes they're reconciled to costs, which means they're, they're not really um, true prospective budgets, and little progress has been made in the commercial market. So, um, I don't think that hospitals right now are well served by the current payment model, and I don't think that employers and consumers are well served by it either. So um, with all that as context, I think a better way of paying for hospitals would be to provide hospitals with an all-payer global budget. Um, this is was this concept of a global budget was one of the ideas that Elliot introduced. I think um, under such a budget, hospitals would know their revenue for a 12-month period in advance for all of their major payers. They could then focus on meeting community need and managing their expenses and not on filling beds and, and generating revenue. Uh, again, I, I think that um, there have been some steps taken in that direction using the payment models that OneCare has introduced with some of its hospitals, but it's just not been enough. Uh, this would provide hospitals with financial accountability, uh, I'm sorry, financial accountability, but also rewards for improved performance and quality and community health. Um, I think it needs to be coupled with regular reasonable increases in payment rates from both Medicare and Medicaid. I think that's a necessary quid pro quo here. Uh, and I note that um, Maryland's had some successful experience with all payer hospital global budgets. Um, they've been evaluated and published. I'll also note that Rhode Island is currently considering a modified and more flexible approach to that of, of Maryland uh, and, and seriously considering it. And finally, um, my third set of, of recommendations have to do with uh, public accountability. I think a sustainable um, hospital system has to be an accountable one, and, and I think that um, there are a few things that can be done for accountability, public reporting of how hospital performance incentives are structured, what their measures and targets are and incentives is important, public reporting of performance on a broad range of measures, including improving community health, especially if, um, if Vermont is to move to uh, true um, hospital global budgets, and then perhaps annual public hearings to talk about performance results and how to generate improvements. So, um, so last, I, uh, I just want to share a few comments on the topic of waste, um, which resonates for me very much. Um, the um, Shrank article that Elliot referenced and, uh, and described in uh, the slide from the Berwick-Hackbarth study defines waste quite broadly, um, and, and it includes within waste prices. So um, I think I've talked about prices, particularly in the commercial market, because that's where the waste is in the commercial market. Um, but there's also, as, as Elliot highlighted, a tremendous amount of waste in clinical care. Um, and I didn't focus on this in my recommendations because I've not been able to find any state that's found a way to reduce waste in clinical care, um, as maddening as that is. Uh, and including states uh, states and I should say um, nonprofit um, community organizations that have taken on choosing wisely 
Um, I haven't found one compelling example of a broad based effort to do this. Um, I, I still, though, have hope that that's possible. Um, I have long thought that um, that standardization of healthcare delivery and creation of the type of single system that Elliot talked about might be through um, might be possible through One Care Vermont. I don't think that's happened yet. Um, I'd like to think that the Green Mountain Care Board, through its oversight function, might be able to help um, push towards um, greater standardization of healthcare delivery that that drives down waste and and creating a more efficient single system is possible. Um, but uh, I want to note that uh, that is probably the most difficult challenge of everything that I've just presented. And I just put some really big boulders in front of you as policy objectives. So um, I, I, uh, I am um, inherently optimistic uh, and that pessimism that Elliot talked about, it does not reside in me, but I just want to note that, that that's a really hard change. Thank you, Michael. Um, that was excellent. And now we will move to Dr. Bruce Hamery, who is last but certainly not least. Um, Dr. Bruce Hamery is a partner and the chief medical officer for the health and life sciences practice, Oliver Wyman. He assists hospitals, health systems, and large practices to redesign and reorient themselves to patient-centered and population-based care. In prior times, he was an executive vice president and chief medical officer for Geisinger, having responsibility for the clinical operations, which you so brilliantly set up, um, Michael, thank you, um, research and educational activities of the $4 billion organization. So he was a professor and associate dean at Penn State and served as an executive director of the University Hospitals. And he currently serves on the board of the Bozeman Health in Montana, excuse me, and has previously served on the boards of several health insurers and other hospital systems. Welcome, Dr. Bruce Hamery, and, and thank you for joining us. Well, thank you. And uh, thanks to the Green Mountain board, uh, uh, Care Board for the invitation. Uh, my uh, assignment to follow this uh, esteemed lineup of people who have spent entire careers trying to solve this um, is uh, daunting. And I have to thank all three of you for, um, you know, sort of economics is the dismal science, right? Um, so what I'd like to talk about is how uh, places have, have tried to um, support community-based care and rural care with the caveats that you just heard from Mr. Bailett and from Dr. Fisher. And that is that uh, a, lot of, a lot of the uh, current inpatient facilities have been repurposed. So uh, if Kara, if we could go to the next slide, please. And then the one after that, that's just a Okay, so the problem I think folks have outlined, I've put some uh, another slide here if you go to the next one. Uh, you've seen this operating revenue is terrible proportion of hospital revenue, even for that terrible operating revenue, about a third of it probably shouldn't need to be in the hospital. If you had if, if adequate access to appropriate community level services was available. Um, average daily census is low, lower in some places than others. Need to reduce beds has been uh, um, commented on. And I would agree clearly that one of the things the um, current outbreak of uh, COVID has shown is that, this, that the system can adapt Right, we don't have to have keep 153 beds or 300 beds in operation, pay for all the, the maintenance costs and the upkeep costs, and in a time when the resources are constrained, just because in some period we might need them. Just in the same way, we do not keep uh, a, a major hospital like UVM with empty beds in case a 747 crashes in Burlington. Um, Okay, so uh, let's go to the next slide, please. Okay, now there are some national stressors to this. Number one uh, is a nursing shortage. 
And you've probably seen things uh, in the news in the last several days about hospitals being uh, short staffed because people are calling out sick. But it's more than that. It's because nurses are retiring or leaving the profession. And the projected needs for a number of years have been in excess of the number of nursing people who can be trained. This has gotten to the point where because of the extreme shortages during COVID, these folks that are hired in as quote traveling nurses are uh, are being hired in at a cost sometimes of $300 an hour rather than the $34 an hour that was the national average two years ago. There are also increasing salaries and shortages for all the other professional people that hospitals need to run, shortage of workers in entry-level jobs, housekeeping and dietary, physician shortages in a number of areas, and those getting worse as well because physicians are aging out. Um, we talked about reducing elective surgery. The other thing which is interesting is that um, Dr. Fisher and I and some others trained in a time when doctors expected to work about 60 hours a week plus. The current average uh, in the U.S., according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, is 51 hours. And the new graduates, at least the ones we're trying to hire in Montana, um, and I live in Boston, by the way, so uh, but the ones we're trying to hire in Montana are expecting a 40 hour work week. No more than one night in four to five on call and most prefer one in six. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, lifestyle, which for the is important for everybody. So so the point is that, you know, having a doc practice in a small community like my grandfather did where he was on call 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, and gonna show up if somebody got sick, those days are pretty well over. And it needs to be taken into account when we think about, about personnel issues, man, if you will, manpower issues, physicians, APNs, and so forth. Okay, and then third bullet from the bottom is a key one, and it has been mentioned. And that is that in a number of areas, there is an association between the number of times you do something and how good you are at it, between volume and outcomes. And so as you think about things like obstetrics, and you know, at the high end, everybody thinks about neurosurgery, you need to have people at a place where they can do enough so that they maintain their skills. You do not want you know, somebody doing 20 a year and hoping that the outcomes are good. Last two issues are that other things that are beginning to drive price, although hospitals are clearly the, the behemoth here, our pharmaceutical costs are going up and we are currently experiencing supply chain shortages, uh, including, including uh, generic meds. Next slide, please. Uh, so what I want to do is show uh, an example of an integrated organization that I led for a number of years um, as a way to think about regionalizing healthcare. Uh, could we go to the next slide, please? Okay, so this compares the state of Vermont with Geisinger. And I want you to see the population Geisinger serves is about the same as Vermont. Surface area is about uh, three times greater. Uh, number of employed docs at Geisinger is about the same. Uh, this number for Vermont does not include uh, physicians who are non-residents, physicians who are providing telehealth services, or those working less than four hours a week. The number of docs, pretty comparable. Number of hospitals, uh, pretty comparable. The Geisinger service area has uh, twice, at least twice this many hospitals that are not um, Geisinger owned or controlled, some of them medium size, some quite small. A um, number of critical access hospitals, Geisinger has one, hospital beds about the same, counties, medical school, et cetera, et cetera. Just point out to you that down in the lower right, 
Um, there is an alcohol and chemical dependency unit. There is a universal electronic health record, which is key. Now you can do that with the regional health information exchange, but part of the, um, part of the secret to reducing duplicative care and inappropriate care is the ability of the doc who's seeing the patient to know what happened, right? And then the next is that we had a, and have a centralized telehealth hub. And you, I think, have an, uh, an addition of this at the university hospital, but this drives telestroke, uh, heart attacks, uh, emergency room oversight, and so, and home health for that matter. Next slide. Okay, these are just the three major groups of Geisinger, the provider facilities, the physician group, and then it does own its own health plan, which um, since I've gone has, has also become a Medicaid managed care group in, as well as a um, Medicare Advantage program and commercial uh, insurer. Next slide. Uh, Geisinger Medical Center, just a, a quick shot. This is a 530 bed hospital, which Elliot came by 10 years ago and told us was already too big before that bed tower was added. 530 bed hospital in a town of 3,500, of 5,000 people. Okay, we employ almost 9,000 people at that site. Now, as I showed you, the service area is huge, but this is level one trauma, bone marrow transplants, kidney transplants, so forth and so on, women's hospital, children's hospital, so forth. Major academic center now, bought a medical school four years ago, Elliot. And so, uh, but had in, in previous times, 25 approved residencies, 35 fellowships and so forth. So big place, very small town, density of docs to population in the county is higher than Mayo Clinics because Mayo's in a big, and for Elliot's information, this and Dartmouth are the only two federally approved rural academic health centers in the U.S. And we can talk about what that means. Next slide. Okay, so this is the service area of Pennsylvania. The dark blue is Geisinger's primary service area, the lighter blue secondary service area, and the outline in gold is the area served by Geisinger Health Plan. <clears throat> and what I want to point out is right in the dead middle of that uh, blue area is a tiny little county called Montour County. That's where Geisinger and Geisinger has a air transport system that involves five helicopters. The service area in the blue, in the light blue and dark blue is roughly 25,000 square miles. It's mountains. The biggest industry in that area is logging and timber. Geisinger is the largest employer with about 20,000 folk, but the biggest industry is logging. So mountainous, Rural Tioga County up there at the top is said to have more people, more deer than people. So in that sense, similar to what uh, the issues that you face with, uh, you know, a lot of small towns. Next slide. This just shows the district, the population. Uh, this is old, old data. You see down the lower right, it's about 1.3 million managed either by the health system or in conjunction with the health plan and then by the health plan. Uh, and by the, so the quality metrics and so forth are lined up between those two, although the way that the care is influenced is different. Next slide. This shows, uh, and I'm gonna sort of skip through the next two slides, but this just shows the multi-year journey that this takes. I think it's, Several of the speakers have commented on nothing happens quickly. And this is just as true in a totally um, not, I won't say controlled system. I'm not sure anybody controls physicians or nurses or any of that because you still have to get consensus. You have to get consensus with the communities about the care that you are able to provide that in their location and what care you are able to provide that meets their needs elsewhere. Next slide. 
And I'm going to just skip this one and the next one. This is detail. Next slide. Next, thank you. OK, so let's think about regionalizing healthcare, And I'm going to talk about some of the things Geisinger has done and also a number of other health systems and large hospitals have done. And, you know, Elliot has, has I think, spoken very um, eloquently about Dr. Hammer, I think you're on mute. Or uh, just... I'm sorry. So I, I, I'm sorry, didn't. So what we're going to talk about is regionalizing healthcare and ways to think about how you can support healthcare in smaller communities that may not have the population or economic means sufficient to uh, to uh, preserve a full time inpatient facility. Next slide. OK, so we think about tiering health care, both in um, the ambulatory arena, primary care, secondary level specialty care, and then higher end specialty care, as well as in facilities. And I think Mr. Ballot commented on a primary care center. And so the, you know, the classic of this uh, thing, Don Berwick and others started 25 years ago, patient centered medical home with a staff that is that is team based and has additional support depending on the number of patients so staffing with a physician and advanced practice person um, you know you can care for 2000 to 2500 people you can add specialists in mental health pharmacists podiatrists some you know for a, a um, federally qualified health center you may have a dentist and so forth um, they provide simple diagnostic services, so some radi radiology, EKG, that sort of thing, and importantly, some simple treatment services. So, for example, they can do inhalation therapy for somebody with an acute asthma attack, so they don't have to go to the ED. They have the capability of providing an infusion, so they can treat uh, a person who has a, a, a skin infection of the leg. Um, or, you know, in, in uh, some instances like Huntsman Cancer Center, perhaps do chemotherapy under supervision. And then secondly, you have other, the, what I call the primary level of specialists, the folks that when the primary care doc thinks he or she needs help, they go to the mental health folks, the cardiologist, the general surgeon, and so forth. And those people can be aggregated in reasonably close by centers with more enhanced diagnostic facilities, perhaps linked, you, you know, using a hospital uh, as a base that had operating rooms so that they can do ambulatory surgery. And remember that more and more surgery um, has been approved by Medicare to be done on an ambulatory basis. So knees, for example, total knees. Um, and, uh, you know, th this is changing very rapidly. I have to tell you, I graduated from medical school 50 years ago, and the amount of change in the last 10 years has been absolutely phenomenal. Next slide. Okay, tiering facilities. Again, we've heard about uh, the mention of a freestanding ED, uh, which you can combine with an ambulatory surgery unit. You can have observation beds there, a couple, just you know, to to make sure somebody's stable. You know, with the, with diagnostic facilities, medium-sized hospital, a little higher care, uh, and these bed sizes are, you know, very approximate. Tertiary hospital, you'd think about the university, the really high-end stuff. Uh, and then the quaternary hospital. Now it turns out, and we've done these analytics for a number of um, academic health systems, that quaternary university hospital stuff is 3% of all of their business. 
3%. Okay, the rest of it is community level stuff. And that gets to Dr. Fisher's point about why does it cost so much? Now, having run one of those places, we can talk about that, but okay. Now, the, the bottom here, again, just to repeat, at any level of care, the person delivering that care, doctor, nurse, whoever, needs to see enough to be competent. If they're not, then that is not high quality care. And for me, high quality care is the first threshold, right? If it's not high quality, go somewhere else. And so I think another question that the board could consider, and I have not seen in any of the stuff I've been sent to review, is what proportion of people are voting with their feet and bypassing an, a, a, an available facility in order to go somewhere else. That is something that when we assist health systems to look at their needs and futures that we look at. Next slide. Uh, this is just an example of tiering and it shows <clears throat> taking the duplication shown in the top level of this slide, particularly in the secondary care, uh, and moving and, and then redistributing that. Um, next slide. Okay, so what do you need to do in order to accomplish this? Well, the first thing is you've got to have good information transfer systems, broadband, at least between the provider sites. The second and very important is you need transportation. You've got to have ways to get people from A to B quickly. And I'll give as an example what are called the STEMI programs, which is the, uh, the, the American Heart and other approved programs for taking care of people with acute myocardial infarcts. And that standard is basically time from pickup to balloon in the coronary artery at 90 minutes. Geisinger could get that done in 60 minutes from 200 miles away. Faster than New York City because we used helicopters and they couldn't. That works published. So some system of helicopters, ground transport, and don't forget patient transport to available services, which is a problem in the disadvantaged. Some sort of central um, mechanism for finding, you know, getting people from place to place and knowing where uh, beds are, right? Because we, we hear every day, I don't know about Vermont in particular, but we hear every day of somebody spending hours on the phone trying to find a bed for a patient, now a lot of aggravated by COVID, but winding up states away. So examples of, of region and a centralized way to share the health data. Again, it can be a regional information exchange. Uh, examples, trauma system, uh, been around a long time. Uh, as I, At least as I was able to find out, Vermont does not have a recognized uh, trauma system. STEMI program we've talked about, Geisinger, most other large health systems. Tell a stroke program, Geisinger had roughly 10 hospitals, two or three we did not own in that. Partners has 30 hospitals that they manage out of Austin. Uh, electronic ICU uh, provides the ability to monitor intensive care beds and step down units and other sorts of beds at any location at any distance. Um, a lot of folks use that, require standardized treatment protocols, can support, as I've said here, STEMI, telestroke, and so forth. Number of hospital systems, teleradiology, people read. These systems have what are called Nighthawk services, where they don't have a radiologist on call to the emergency room. They ship those films uh, via electronic means to a group in Idaho. Uh, telepathology, you can read slides for for um, surgical procedures if the, you have a technician at the site that can produce it. Tele, telemedicine, military have been doing that for many years. And with uh, COVID, many, many people have had experience with this. Um, uh, 
the uh, patients generally view it as positive, a uh, little less so among older folks, and it obviously depends on whether you have access to broadband. There are groups, uh, Sanford Health in North and South Dakota, Avera Health in North and South Dakota, that do uh, provide tele uh, oversight of pharmacy services in smaller hospitals. So next slide, please. This is a slide of the network that Avera Health provides services to. And so you see it's uh, six states, very rural, small hospitals. They provide um, not only pharmacy services, but also emergency room oversight. And what they say is that, you know, with the average response time of a doc to an, uh, who's at home to an emergency room being half an hour or thereabouts, they can get somebody online in 15 minutes to help the nurse or the PA who's in need. They can also do consults for infectious disease and endocrine and whatever, and with the EICU capability support that. They have just been bringing up the capability to do um, oversee uh, nursing homes. Now, again, all this has to deal with regulation and payment mechanisms and so forth. Next slide. Okay, what are some other things that folks are doing? Next slide. Okay, one program that has not been mentioned is PACE, a program of all-inclusive care for the elderly. This is a federal program, been around at least 20 years, now really being used like an insurance program. It takes people who are duly eligible, eligible for Medicare and Medicaid, combines those dollars and gives them to a designated program that has a community oversight board and so forth. There was no program like this that I could find registered in Vermont. Uh, we have done this at Geisinger in two locations, one in a city, Scranton, the other in a very small town called Shamokin, which has a very high proportion of elderly people. One of my epidemiologists told me once that the quickest way to get out of Pennsylvania was to die because it is such an elderly group in the rural, uh, rural areas. And what these services provide is adult daycare with a doc, primary care there, dental services, care at home. When the folks come in, they can get meals, they get their meds, they can uh, be counseled by a pharmacist or a social worker. Um, they can get occupational therapy. Uh, in, in effect, is a capitated program. It takes about 60 people, 60 patients per site to keep this going because people die off, right? If you're sick enough to need a nursing home, this will support you for a while. It'll keep you out of the hospital, keep you out of the nursing home, but, um, you know, you have to have a constant influx of new people. Next slide. Hospital at home has been mentioned, and I think this is an important thought. Uh, this originated at Hopkins uh, 10, 15 years ago. It has been widely used as a way to shorten inpatient length of stay to get people out of the hospital when they can't, you know, if your nursing home capacity is constrained, whatever. It's been used as a way to avoid, quote, social admissions from the ED, where you know, you can't arrange for an IV or something uh, uh, at home uh, and a way to reduce dependence on chronic care. I would note that there is now a commercial company that just within the last couple of weeks got $110 million invested by Kaiser Permanente and Mayo that does this that has protocols, supports it electronically, and so forth and so on. Uh, so it's not something any longer that people need to have the internal capability to develop. Uh, it's used to shorten, well, we've talked about that, reduces risk of hospital-associated complications, some of those things, and, and I spent 25 years of my life trying to reduce hospital infections and falls. Uh, requires careful patient selection, good broadband connections, reliable electricity. Okay, if you're on a respirator or whatever, 
you need reliable electricity uh, and availability of clinical staff to go out and see the patient. Usually nurses, if folks are quite sick, this may be a physician. But again, those things can be supported with uh, telehealth uh, means. And this has been uh, generally a patient satisfier because the bed's softer, the food's better, nobody's waking you up at 3 a.m. to take your blood pressure. Next slide. Okay, now I'm gonna take you way far down the road. And that is home as hospital. Because we still think in terms of healthcare delivery, many people as an inpatient operation. It needs to be thought of more as a home-based thing. And so the concept would be do everything you can at home unless it takes major surgery or a machine, an imaging machine you can't put in a truck. Again, you have to have broadband service, electrical service, adequate water and sewage, and transportation. It needs staffing. It needs home services. But Look at the diagnostic services that are currently done with electronic means, vital signs, weight, EKG, EEG, arterial oxygen levels, uh, electronic stethoscopes, otoscopes, and there are managed care companies that send these out to families so that they can look in the kids here, see it on the screen, the doc can see it, and they can avoid a, a visit. Um, diagnostic services potentially available, but used in hospitals, portable handheld ultrasound. You can diagnose appendicitis, you can diagnose gallbladder disease with a certain um, degree of um, accuracy. Um, MGH is, and MIT reported they've got a portable MRI unit. Now that's very experimental. We currently have breathalyzers approved for diagnosis of flu. One was just approved by FDA for um, approval of COVID diagnosis. And as you may have seen, California has just begun to make available self-test kits for um, sexually transmitted infections because their public health capacity is not high. And these are rel relatively easily administered and very accurate. There are a number of treatments that have been given in the home for many years. Uh, for example, acute and chronic dialysis has been given, uh, has been, can be home-based. And I, you know, help get people home on these since the 90s. Um, but, you know, I'll just point out that even in LVAD, uh, an external, this was an externally um, uh, uh, powered pump for somebody's heart, people have been sent home on that. You actually have a lower risk of hospital-associated infection with that. Okay, next slide. Okay, so where do we wind up? Next slide. Number one, um, as the Greek philosopher Heraclitus said, you cannot step twice into the same river because the river is not the same and you are not the same. So please think about redesigning your health delivery system as well as your insurance system, right? You cannot keep what you've got, not sustainable. And, you know, I think Elliot and his colleague have spoken very well to the capacity issues with hospitals and physicians and so forth and so on. And the way that you have to deal with that is you have to help people rethink how and where they're going to get health care. And you need to rethink. Okay. So... You, you can think about maximizing some of these delivery systems on a statewide basis. And I frankly am not familiar enough with Vermont to know how widespread your STEMI and heart attack, your telestroke programs are. I know the university has set some up in their network, but I don't know how widely they extend around the state. I'm pretty confident you have some good arrangements with Dartmouth at the southern end but I don't have a good sense of the metal. 
<clears throat> this does not imply that you have to own everything. What it does say is that you've got to be coordinated, you've got to have good contracts, and you've got to have common expectations of what's going to happen. So a lot of that process that Elliot mentioned um, and others needs to be gone through in a thoughtful way. But the point being, guys, the old days are over. Right? We cannot sustain this. Um, telehealth has acceptance has been accelerated by COVID, both by patients and physicians and by payers out of necessity. Uh, supporting these structures, as everybody ahead of me has said, needs payment methods other than fee for service, global budget capitation, whatever. Uh, but remember, and this is something often forgotten, that under those payment mechanisms, hospitals are cost centers. They are not profit centers. And right now, everybody's run the hospital as a profit center, right? Got to make money. And the more, the better. It keeps, you know, uh, the bond rating people happy. But that had, again, that's changing. You're going to need to really think about different types of healthcare professionals. So, for example, if you think about home based care, um, you know, you may not need a four year degree trained bac baccalaureate level nurse to do that. Not if there's good support available from an iPhone, okay, for a question. Uh, you're going to need people uh, in IT to go out and make sure the connections work. You're going to need, <clears throat> uh, you're going to perhaps, as some people have done, use the available emergency medicine um, technician people in the community who are not always making a, a house call. You can train them in some of this. They know how to start an IV. They can learn how to use a handheld uh, ultrasound machine. You may need changes to state law and regulation. We heard this, uh, I'm working with some of your folks on another project about access to care. And some of the things we heard from the mental health community, the, uh, sorry, the, uh, the mental health community uh, were about licensure issues. And that may also be the case for the way that your physician assistants and uh, nurse practitioners but, you know, I think one of the things I'd leave you with is to really think hard about what services need to be provided in a bricks and mortar structure that you build to purpose, whether that's a primary care site, a specialty site, a freestanding ED, or a university hospital. What services do you really need to provide there? And to a point earlier made, this all has to interface with the social needs of the people. So if you can't get access to a pharmacy, you can't afford the med, you can't get good food, uh, you know, reasonably healthy food, you know, we're, we're talking about dealing with a train wreck instead of preventing the train wreck. I will point out, Geisinger began a program about three years ago of uh, food as a prescription where they actually have a pharmacy that with a doctor's order will dispense healthy food to a diabetic patient. And that, that has helped. There are also a number of health systems that have now announced that they're gonna spend dollars on low income housing because they've identified that they've got people that don't, that are sleeping in a car or under a bridge and you can't manage health in that situation. So, you know, I, I think these are other pieces that will need to be integrated. So at any rate, i um, happy to take uh, with my colleagues questions later. I think that's the last slide. Thank you, Dr. Bruce Hamery. Um, so I had a couple of questions teed up, but in the interest of time, I wanna make sure we, we get all board questions and get to public comment. Um, I will turn it back to you, Chair Mullen, and maybe squeeze my question at the end. <laughs> thank you, Elena, and uh, thank you to the panel. There's a lot to digest, and uh, Dr. Hamery, I'd like to uh, talk to you at some point about some of the creative things that have been done here in Vermont, like the, the Veggie Van Gogh program. Um, when you talk about uh, 
prescribing uh, foods uh, to uh, diabetics as a healthy uh, um, alternative. Um, we've been doing some of those creative things through our uh, accountable care organization here in the state of Vermont now. And uh, um, we also, um, I, I want to give credit to some hardworking people at our SASH program here in the mm -hmm. state of Vermont. The uh, It's been the one program that the federal government has actually seen a positive uh, return on investment for um, and uh, would like to be able to uh, take lessons learned in Vermont uh, to elsewhere in the country. But th what I wanted to do to throw out the first question to the uh, panel is much has been said already about the workforce. And as we know, healthcare is a, a people business and it's taking care of people. Uh, primarily by other people who are the providers. And um, we are facing a historic shortage of providers, one that uh, we've struggled with um, even pre-pandemic, but it's been exacerbated. It's not just a Vermont problem, but a U.S. problem. And I'm just curious if any of the, the panelists have thoughts on um, what some of their um, ideas could do for this workforce crisis and um, possible other solutions. So I'll I'll throw it out to any one of the panelists who uh, might want to put some input into that. Elliot, your lips are moving, but we can't hear you. Well, it, it, it's hard. Did you can you hear me now? We can. <laughs> so so first, I, I think Bruce has given us the answer, which is innovate and redesign. Um, I'm skeptical that there's actually a shortage. Uh, one of the, um, I'm sure there are shortages in some areas, but one of the thought experiments I would encourage us all to, to make um, is, to, is to think about when you see the next patient. So every the most expensive decision any physician makes besides hospitalizing a patient, or maybe even more expensive, is when do you see them again? Right. And we tried to get the VA to run a randomized yeah. trial. If every physician, so just this is your thought experiment, if every physician in the country just said, I'm gonna take whatever I would have put before, a week, two weeks, two months, three months, and simply doubled it for all of their routine patients, what would happen to the effective supply of physicians in the United States? Bruce obviously knows the answer. <laughs> Dr. Henry knows the well, answer. We've, we've actually done some of that. But no, you're right. I want our members, our, our, our wonderful board to tell you know, us. When you, when you look at, for example, um, went to a place a number of years ago where, you know, they had a hospital, a good hospital, and the hospital director could not get his um, uh, employed people that he was self-insured for in with diabetes into his own uh, employed endocrinology office. And it turns out when you looked at it, what Elliot said was exactly right. The problem was the endocrinology guy had a group of people that he was just seeing every two or three months and they were stable. They could have gone back to their primary care doc. So you got rid of that and suddenly he had massive capacity. We've seen this, saw this at Geisinger, where we had a, a, a former chief of neurology, great diagnostician, couldn't get in to see him because his clinic was filled with return patients. They'd come back, they'd exchange tomatoes, talk about grandchildren <laughs> and all that. And so what we did was put a PA in front of him and everybody that he had been seeing for longer than a year the PA turned around and sent back to their primary care doc. So so you got access to a guy with really world-class diagnostic care, which is what you needed. And those people who didn't need to be seen by that specialist sent back to where they should be. So Elliot's exactly right. Um, and I think, you know, and the other question is the level of person, right? If you're a stable diabetic, and your hemoglobin A1C is controlled, yada, yada, you do not necessarily need to be seeing a doc. You could see a very good nurse practitioner or a physician's assistant uh, at a much less frequent interval. I, I will, um, I'd like to just add to this. I think that this is a um, really important way to be thinking about this. I think that, you know, the examples that, it, I think the most sort of, um, 
the graphic example these days is the felt nursing shortage. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, with that, you know, the price of, of nursing care and the, um, you know, has skyrocketed for, you know, for, for providers and in some markets. And, you know, we, we don't, it's hard. I mean, and Elliot, it's hard to know how things will sugar out you know, a year from now. It's really, really hard to know. We, so what we do know is this. We do know that, um, that nursing is fundamental uh, in terms of the delivery system. It's a flexible workforce. It's one that is, you know, very much patient-centered. Uh, uh, and it is one that for which there's a much shorter lag in training than there is for many other any other providers or clinicians, uh, and and we certainly have seen you know uh, I think great benefit from the increased you know sort of professional stature of nursing, uh, and then being able to practice up to their their you know the qualifications, uh, and uh, at the same time there is a lag, so it, you know expanding you know nursing training programs and you know Vermont has them okay. I mean, you know, Dartmouth doesn't have one, right? I mean, we have sort of a, you know, a relationship with a, with a college nearby. But so expanding nursing training is, you know, I, I would guess, because you have to guess, that it's in the public interest. However, it doesn't speak to the immediate need or even the medium term need. I mean, and, and we don't know if you train more nurses, you know, where they're going to settle either. So it may not help Vermont. So delivery innovation is absolutely critical, you know, and and it is the only thing that we can do that can be done in the short term. Uh, and it may very well be what we're, what is going to save the system, both in terms of being able to provide care and quality care and in terms of cost in, in the longer term. So I would, um, you know, I would, I think I just agree that, that focusing on this, that those sort of innovative ideas is terrifically important right now. I have one other idea, because I think it's a critically important question, which is better data. Um, I think the crisis in access to um, specialist, specialist care would be well served by doing the kinds of analyses um, that Dr. Hamry uh, proposed, which is understand how the current workforce is being utilized. So there may well be physicians who are working you know, incredibly efficiently um, and there may be others who are seeing their patients every three months, um, regardless of need. So I think data could also be an important early step in providing insights about where the shortages are and how you might reduce them. Right. I No, I, I agree. I think another thing to think about is, you know, we have tended to think about um, you know, I agree. Nurses are incredibly important. Nothing happens in healthcare without good nurses period. But we have tended to think of that group as monolithic. There has been a, a real effort, I think appropriately for hospital-based folk, to get every all nurses to a BSN level, a baccalaureate level. It may be the case that for certain things that are might be done in the home, given a bath, for example, you do not need a nurse. Uh, it may be the case that in order to give an IM injection, you do not need a nurse. Now, you may need one for an IV, but I think these are things that that folks need to re-examine, right? I was told a long time ago the reason the nurse needed to give a bed bath was because she needed to be able, or he, needed to be able to check the condition of the skin and the vital signs and see if the person was awake. We now have electronic ways to do that. So I, I think this this whole idea of who's doing what to and for whom is also something in terms of innovation that in light of new technology and these advances could be rethought. Now, I, I don't know whether the Green Mountain Health Board wants to take that on, but uh, but certainly, you know, it, it should be thought about. Okay, I'm going to call on board members in alphabetical order for questions. So that means we'll start with board member Jessica Holmes. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Uh, a sincere thank you. 
a lot of intellectual capital and collective experience on this on this panel, and I appreciate the insights. Uh, I also just want to say I appreciate, the, I think, what's much needed optimism in terms of Vermont, maybe the state where we can get this right. Uh, if we, you know, engage stakeholders and policymakers, and we're willing to to work towards building a more optimal system, um, I wanted to ask a couple questions. One is a lot of discussion about efficiency of the system or inefficiency of the system, and overcapacity and undercapacity. And I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit more specifically about how we actually measure. What are the, you know, metrics that we use? What is the data that we actually should collect to measure efficiency of the system or to identify? That we are at over capacity or, or under capacity um, in a particular area. So just can anybody speak a little bit to that? If we're about to engage in, you know, data collection and some of these exercises, what do we need to be collecting? Well, I, I'll jump in since I'm a I've been a data geek for you know 50 odd years. Um, and just quickly, I think you know the kinds of data systems that Bruce has pointed out would allow you to do to track, you know, define cohorts of patients by every condition, a primary care population, define them by specialty, whether it's rheumatoid arthritis or multiple sclerosis or joint pain, and then compare um, outcomes ideally, but even without outcomes, just comparing the efficiency of utilization over the next three months or six months or year, um, you can reveal incredible variations both across the state and across providers within a given practice. And that will give you insights into the opportunities to improve the efficiency with which care is delivered. When Mass General did that for their primary care physicians, whether it's ordering high cost imaging or the frequency of visits, they found fourfold variation within a single group, you know, within a single 25 member group practice, and then started the discussion about how can we change care? So I think data will help you um, measure it at the at the clinical levels that will give feedback to each specialty. Yeah, and, and I would add, you know, ideally you'd like to be able to benchmark to best practice nationally, but at least be able to look at variation within the state because that's gonna drive you towards systematizing care delivery in a way that typically doesn't exist and you'll drive out the unnecessary variation and get to better efficiency. Totally agree. Right. And I, you know, I think another thing just to, to add on to these two points is that, for example, access to cancer care or screening, look at the proportion of your new cancer diagnoses that are stage one or two. Right. And how that compares nationally, because if you have a lot of folks being caught late, what that's saying is you can't get them in for their screening or they're not getting screening. So I think there's some of these other population sort of measures that might help as well. That's really helpful. And, and you know, one of the things that we've asked for in our ACO budget process was for the ACO to report in April when they come back to us on their data and variations in care across the HSAs. So. Um, some of that will be happening. Um, hopefully, we'll be able to, to learn more from that process. Um, so I want to ask a little bit about so several of the panels you've advocated for global budgets and capitated payment systems. Um, and in fact, it might be an answer to reducing some of the waste in some of those categories that Dr. Fisher outlined in that slide. And I'm just wondering, so global payment you know, might help us remove some of that waste. I'm wondering if the panelists might speak to what role the legislature, Medicaid, private insurers, the ACO, the Green Mountain Care Board, other stakeholders might play in reducing some of that care delivery waste. You know, aside from just looking at the data, analyzing it and hoping that, you know, sharing the data might move the needle on some of reducing some of the, you know, unnecessary uh, delivery. Are there any other roles for other the sort of the state stakeholders here? So I think you need to compel multi-payer alignment on this because it doesn't work unless everyone's doing the same thing. And your biggest problem has been the commercial market where you've got the least adoption of it. And so clearly I think that there is a potential role for the legislature and the board to play there in giving a nudge. Um, I, I think Medicaid's been a leader in doing this in the state. And I think in your, in your next, um, agreement negotiation with Medicare, I would ask them to go a little further than what they've been doing, which I would think they would be a willing partner to do. 
I totally agree on all payer alignment. Yeah. Okay, helpful uh, and important. I, I agree. Um, so I, I guess my last question is really a twofold question. And, it, you know, it seems reasonable to say that we need care delivery reform, a redeployment potentially of hospital resources, that we might need to consolidate, rationalize, regionalize the delivery system, maybe convert, think differently about what hospitals are, freestanding EDs and whatnot. I like the idea of incentivizing hospital at home. Um, done well, I recognize this will, you know, potentially preserve access, lower costs, improve outcomes. But, I, you know, I'm thinking about in practice, operationally, politically, you know, and you've all mentioned, alluded to this, this difficult process that, you know, to get to a truly optimized delivery system. Obviously, we're going to need robust community and multi-stakeholder engagement. And Dr. Fisher, I appreciate that's going to be key. And I'd, I'd love to hear maybe a little bit more about Rethink Health's process. But I guess my same question goes to my last question is what role, you know, beyond a stakeholder engagement, which is really, really important, we need to do. Are there other uh, avenues that the legislature, that the Green Mountain Care Board, that payers, that the ACO, hospital leaders and boards, I mean, what other things could parallel that process? Um, you know, or do we ulti are we ultimately relying kind of on a stakeholder process and a move to a different payment system? Are there other you know avenues to get us there faster, uh, well, you know, with more consensus, things like that? Well, I do. I mean, the the process that led to the Camp David Accords um, that was used for the base close federal base closing commission um, and the New York Commission, although with a, a distinct difference, um, the first two had a strong team actually facilitating a long, you know, a, a long process that invented uh, solutions to closing a base, which was one of the most politically difficult things to do in the world, um, where the community and the congressman who represented them um, ended up supporting the proposal. So I think the way you get the multi-stakeholder process most successfully to work is have someone facilitating that. Um, who can draw the information and then come back and say, did I understand you correctly? Um, so I think the the process that I outlined in that slide um, and in the slides more generally is one that I think can, can pull people together and along enthusiastically. Um, Bruce spoke to the importance of bringing communities along. Absolutely. Um, this is about developing a picture of what could happen that everybody could could get behind. Um, and, you know, the first step, I think, is to maybe you ask the legislature for enough money to hire the consultant that could <laughs> help design and implement such a process. That's how the legislature could help. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I, I guess the, for me, the, a big piece of this is getting people together to envision what they really want and how they want their health care to be provided. Right. Um, you know, I, well, uh, no point in going into personal story, but, but, you know, I, it just seems to me that there's a lot of pressure on this. It's not just on the global stuff, but for example, some of the big national payers have acquired companies that are doing primary health care centrally with telehealth and some of these things I mentioned. So, that has, I don't know if that, I doubt that's hit Vermont yet, but that is beginning to hit some other areas of the country. And because, and it's driven in part because the difficulty they have contracting with people, right? But the intent is to, in effect, disintermediate the primary care doc. In part, there's a shortage, in part, they want too much money, all that stuff. So some of this is really going ahead. And, um, and, and because of distance and travel times and all that, it may, you know, show up in your neck of the woods soon. I, I, I'd like to add two thoughts on top of those of Elliot and Bruce, because I agree with what they've shared. I think the legislature can help by making this discussion more about how than what. Um, and then two, I think it's very important for the communities that are going to be affected that um, they get something that they don't have right now that addresses a community need 
that inpatient beds are not addressing for them. Really, really helpful. And my, my last question, I guess, really addresses sort of the elephant in the room and the timing of this conversation in the sense that we are living in COVID, right? Our hospitals are, you know, at or near capacity, bursting at the seams. Our healthcare workforce, you know, is spread thin. I recognize we might be thinking about better ways to deploy that healthcare workforce. But I just wanna ask, uh, and some of you alluded to this too, but how do we plan for that ideal capacity, that ideal distribution of our, uh, you know, thin workforce uh, in a way that factors in the pandemic that we're in right now and the recognition that maybe this is a hundred year pandemic, maybe it isn't. How do we ensure that our hospital system, our healthcare system has the flexibility to pivot when there is a pandemic or there is some you know, acute need? So how do we factor that into any kind of long-term optimization? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm your infectious disease guy and epidemiologist in this group. And I'll just say it's gonna take time right, as you work the process, as nobody knows, right, the current predictions, okay, it's going to become endemic, and, but, you know, we have problems with flu every year. Hospitals get overwhelmed in January, February, ICUs fill up, more people die, that kind of thing. So, I think part of the answer is you can't probably sit down and calculate it right now, but what you can say is maintaining the resource to expand, let's say a 15 bed hospital to a 30 bed hospital is not gonna help you, well, right? And I, I think the other thing is that one of the things that's been learned in COVID is not everybody needs to be admitted to the hospital. And a lot of people that were admitted, you know, two years ago would not be admitted now. There are actually better predictive models for if you're admitted and you need to go to an ICU, are you gonna, get out. Okay, so I think those kind of things help, but I think at the end of the day, one just has to plan that the need for surge capacity may not be in, quote, the classical four walls of a hospital. And I think people have shown that all over, uh, you know, that you can put stuff up in a parking garage if you need to. You need a roof, you got to run plumbing and that kind of stuff, but you can get that done. Hugely helpful. Thank you, Chair Mellon. I'm done. Thank you for your comments. Thank you, Jess. Next, we'll turn to board member Robin Lunch. Robin. Hi, and I just wanted to echo Jess's thank yous um, to the panel. Very much appreciate you being here today and sharing your expertise. Um, so I think one of the challenges um, I think about as a policy person and now regulator particularly around care delivery, is that at least in Vermont, uh, our government entities are not particularly well set up in terms of staffing and resources to do the kind of analysis um, that we've been talking about here today. And so um, one of the things I struggle with, not to, not to land in the pessimistic category, <laughs> but I'm kind of there, um, is that I think this kind of long-term multi-year uh, project that needs to be well-resourced in order to be done well is not something that I think we as a state has have done particularly well in the past. Um, so that's really more, I guess, comments. Um, and to, to Michael's point, I think there are things that government, um, at least in the United States and in Vermont, do well and things that uh, we don't do as well. And so what I'm sort of struggling with is um, how we can move forward um, because I do think, and I said this when we heard from our previous consultants in October, this is bigger than the board. The board alone is not going to pull this off, particularly not with our current levels of staff and resources. Uh, this need, And we shouldn't this should be a much larger discussion. It should involve communities. It should involve the legislature. Um, and so I think that uh, that we really have to start to think about this as a longer and bigger uh, project. That's really more of a comment and reaction than, than a question, I guess. Um, although I would welcome uh, any reactions if people would like to comment on my comment. Well, you know, I certainly, uh, you know, Bob, and I certainly agree. 
Um, it's not going to happen instantly. Uh, I think, you know, if we look at the co continued trajectory of both hospital vulnerability, though, um, and rising costs together, uh, that's a pretty serious crisis that we're facing. Um, we are at a moment where the governor might be talking about tax cuts. It sounds like there may be some resources. And I don't know how many years it would take us to earn back, uh, you know, a couple hundred thousand, five hundred thousand dollar a year investment um, if we actually got global budgets and deflected healthcare spending. I bet we pay. I bet it would pay for it um, out of the various pension funds very quickly. So that my my source of flipping the problem. Um, also, we have a, a one year to negotiate um, the, the all payer model, which is a tremendous opportunity for us to think right. about what that should look like and how might it be better. Yeah. Well, and to, I guess just to, I, I agree with your, your comments, Ms. Lunch. I, I think you're right on. And it does take a sustained effort. It will take assignment of the responsibility with resource to a particular group and some legislative oversight uh, and obviously a budget. Uh, but I would warn, and I, you know, I'll defer to the health economist in the group and others, that you know, at the rate the smaller hospitals are going, you may not have more than four or five years unless somebody's prepared to throw millions at them, which I don't think anyone is. So, you know, so to some degree, this is a question of getting things organized and planned and, and having plans or just just being faced with a crisis. Thank you. I appreciate that because I think we, you know, we had our first um, meeting panel presentation around hospital sustainability issues in the spring of 2019. Um, and part of what we spent the rest or me in particular spent the rest of the year doing was working with a group of folks with the called the Rural Health Services Task Force to bring forward some recommendations to the legislature, many of which have been acted on. But then, of course, COVID hit. So, um, I appreciate your comments, and I do feel like if we just pause, um, by the time the pandemic has finally, fingers crossed, <laughs> when we're on the other side of it, um, it will become a crisis, and we won't have enough time to react. So uh, I really appreciate that. Um, I think uh, I also wanted to... Uh, just make a comment on um, sort of our hospital budget process and uh, some of the recommendations, Michael, that you provided. Um, I, I thought that some of your recommendations were really aligned with some of the work that we've start, our staff has started to do internally to look at the hospital budget process and um, see how we can refine that process so that uh, it's more effective as a as um, not just cost containment, but also a sustainability tool. Like the hospital budget process frequently during, at some point, I usually say during deliberations, it acts as a, a sledgehammer, not a scalpel in terms of uh, cost containment. And so um, I, I do think that that is an area where we can uh, refine our regulatory approach to look at price growth in particular, uh, which we do set caps on, but it's at a very high aggregate level and probably not particularly effective in a nuanced way. So I appreciated that. Um, I guess that's really all I, I had to say right now, but thank you again. I really appreciate everyone's thoughts. Just, I guess, a quick question. Are, are any of the hospitals doing um, activity-based costing, or is this still all the old cost-to-charge ratio stuff? Um, it, I think that there's some variation across the hospital. Certainly, critical access hospitals are focused very much on the Medicare uh, cost report uh, type of accounting. Um, but I think that's an area that we could certainly delve in more deeply. Yeah, but when you think about a scalpel, um, that would be helpful. Thank you, Robin. Next, we'll go to board member Tom Pelham. Tom? Well, thank you, and uh, thank the panel very much for all these um, insightful and data-driven ideas. Um, and uh, 
um, you know, hopefully we can take advantage of them. I, I, I just have one question that, that bothers me, and it, it's kind of a Willie Sutton question, um, in that, uh, you know, that uh, I, I worry that, what, what, let, me, let me start it by this way. I do agree that the commercial sector is kind of late to reform in Vermont to a, a, great, a, a great degree. Um, and, um, I, uh, and I do agree that Medicaid, I think, has been a, a leader in terms of fixed perspective payments and putting that in place. But there's one element of that relationship between commercial and, and, the, uh, and Medicaid that I worry is a stopper, kind of a showstopper. And that is the cost shift. And so here's 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 some numbers. Um, uh, Vermont numbers, uh, 2013 to 2019, the Medicaid cost shift increased from 106 million dollars to 243 million dollars. These are numbers that will be in our annual report, which comes out later this week. And that's an uh, average annual growth rate of 13.9 percent um, over in Medicare, which we have less influence over um, their average annual growth shift growth um, of cost shift onto commercial is a 10.4 percent, and the overall is 10.3 percent. So I kind of look at that and think if I'm sitting on the board of a provider, or I'm sitting on a board of a hospital, you know, if I'm a hospital, do I really want to change my utilization patterns, et cetera, when there's this cost shift out there? that can eat it up. Um, and if I am a commercial person, similarly, do I want to kind of change the way I do business um, because the cost shift is there and, and it's kind of a silent partner in Vermont to me, unfortunately. So I guess my question is, is that in the face of those kind of real growth rates, 13.9% for Medicaid, which is uh, an arena that we have some control over um, and and the, the 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 annual average is 23 million dollars uh, in Medicaid cost shift um, as a former state finance commissioner you know I know that that that's not an easy number to solve but it can be it, it, it can be solved um, but is it, is it your sense that that relationship uh, with with the growth rate that's 13 14 percent? Uh, is one that can be worked around, or are, is that growth rate going to have to change? Yeah, let me um, have run a couple of hospitals. I mean, your your point is exactly correct, right? I mean, the hospital needs to make enough money to support its capital and keep the bond, you know, the bond rating people happy and all that. So they're going to cost shift. Now, what you have to remember is the data from Dr. Fisher and colleagues and others is that a lot of that care that's being given for Medicare and Medicaid does not need to be done in the hospital, right? So those costs wouldn't have to be shifted if the care was delivered, or at least not that to that level, would not have to be shifted if the care were given appropriately at a different place or by a different person or with less uh, unnecessary technology. Okay, so I, I think that's where we get back to the issue that uh, Elliot and others have raised of a global budget, but you need to give people the ability to spend the money in different ways, right? I'll just give you an example. Uh, my, my wife, who's a lawyer, wrote the letter to the Medicare people that got them to approve providing transportation from small towns into larger places where we had group practices without this thing of, well, you're uh, unduly influencing people to come to your institution and we're gonna fine you a bunch of millions, okay? Uh, there were some things you couldn't advertise it and this and that. But the point is, there had to be a change in the way the, po the payment policy was thought about in order to make that transportation to an outpatient facility to get care that would uh, obviate the need for inpatient care done. It was a policy thing. 
right? And I certainly can't speak to all those similar things that you might have in Vermont, but certainly there are a bunch of them in Medicaid and some in Medicare that if they could be identified discreetly, and Elliot and others may well know what these uh, you know, discrete things are, but if they could be identified and changed within the context of your operations as a state, that you could uh, markedly decrease the use of um, hospital-centered expensive resources by Medicare and Medicaid patients and commercial patients and take the need or at least dramatically reduce the need for some of this cost shift. Um, I'd like to add something that's going to be a little more controversial. <laughs> um, so I, I, I think it's fair to expect that Medicare and Medicaid um, increase their payments with an with a inflationary adjustment. I'm not going to say anything about the base level of payments, the lower for public payers. We know that. Um, but I do want to note that there is resounding um, research findings on this issue of the cost shift that finds that it doesn't exist. There's lots and lots of research. In fact, I just read and I have it in front of me because I just read it this morning. So Rand published a uh, uh, a document titled Nationwide Evaluation of Healthcare Prices Paid by Private Health Plans in 2020. And I quote, um, in our analysis, we find a very weak relationship between hospital prices and the share of patients treated by that hospital who are covered by either Medicaid or Medicare. So it's really a price shift more than it is a cost shift because hospitals um, are generally using their market power to extract higher prices from commercial payers. Um, they legitimately have concerns about their public payers not increasing their prices, but the prices are going up to the commercial payers, not as a cost shift, but because the hospitals are able to receive higher prices from the commercial payers. Can I, can I frame that in a slightly different way? I completely yeah. agree with Michael. This is this is raising prices is a choice. You can decide to cut costs, keep things efficient, you know, not, you know, not expand A, B, C, or D um, and not raise your prices. And in competitive markets, hospitals do. Make that choice because they have to, to survive to keep their prices down. So I think I'm with Michael. Sorry. <laughs> So I would like you to apply that to the hospital budget process and then come back and talk to me about that. Because I think the problem with the research that's out there is it's not done in a regulated system where we cap net patient revenue and incre imp increase in commercial price. So fair, fair, fair I, I think that that's, that's, I think, uh, why we don't see it the same way as the research, because the research has not looked at Vermont or Maryland. Yeah, I, you know, I guess to to the point made by my two colleagues, the you know the other thing, the piece of this is deciding what you're not going to do, right? So, are there certain services? I'll just make something up. Um, you know, really high end pediatric neurosurgery for stuff at the back of the brain, right? There may be two or three people in the country that do that well. You don't need that provide that service, you need to make sure you can get people to it. And so without knowing how in detail how your system is set up, you know, are there services at any hospital that are low enough volume or require enough other specialized support, the team, the equipment, the whatever, that you just ought to figure, you know, maybe you're sending them to Dartmouth, maybe you're sending them to New York or Boston or wherever, but you might want to take another cut of that because people do tend to want, particularly academic centers, tend to want to say we can do it all. Well, thank you for that. I, I, I do think that, um, as, as Robin was alluding to during our hospital budget process, we spent a lot of time for example, with the, the UVM network hospitals, uh, where I think 20 to 25 percent of their their uh, charge increase was, they say, driven by the cost shift. 
So um, it's out there as a as a uh, kind of a negotiating item. Um, I do know, for example, that for 2021, um, the state made a decision once it became clear that uh, about the um, how deep the the uh, pandemic was was that they were not going to raise uh, reimbursement rates in Medicaid except for those that are federally mandated. So to me, it's it's an issue that needs to get somehow resolved and off the table before people can focus on some of the things that are made that 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 and and opportunities and uh, that that the ideas that the gentlemen are presenting offer. And with that, I will pass it along to the other Tom. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Tom Walsh, do you have some questions, or do you want to take a pass on your initial board meeting? Tom, if you're speaking, we cannot hear you. Thank you. Um, I'll take a pass on questions or comments other than thanking everyone for um, sharing their knowledge and experience with us. Thank you, Tom. So at this point, I'm going to open it up for public comment. And please, uh, members of the public, please direct any of your comments towards me as the chair. Um, so with that, um, if anyone has any public comment, please raise your hand. And I'm going to start with Walter Carpenter. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, just more comment, really nothing on question. I've All of the presenters have pretty much <clears throat> said what I wanted to say about how the system needs to change. We've reached the end point. And I speak as a patient and an activist. And quite frankly, as I was listening to Dr. Fisher talk about it, the thought hit me that for the past 40 years, we've been living under the doctrines of neoliberalism, more or less, and in a generic sense, and the, the idea of neoliberalism has failed in not just healthcare, but it's failed in all aspects of American life. And another thing, when Dr. Fisher had his list of pessimisms, pessimisms, and we don't start, the real big elephant in the room, or probably not even an elephant, but more of an avalanche, is one reason why we don't do an equitable healthcare system is America's racism. And maybe that should be on his list. I don't know, but it's one. It's a huge reason why we don't do an equitable health system. Strong in my memory is uh, Tom Hartman's The Hidden History of American Healthcare, where the reason that we have to Medicare only covers 80 percent, and we're stuck with the rest 20 percent, is that legislators in those days, north and south, east and west didn't want black people to access health care. And I think that's a huge problem today in all 50 states. But that's what I took away from the presentations of all the people here. You know, another one, especially about the waste. Everyone here who mentioned it was correct, and I agree with them. We should also remember that our health system again, in all 50 states, nationally, et cetera, is basically a welfare program for CEOs uh, and shareholders and various, uh, various profit for company, for profit companies. You know, in Vermont, we have executives starting at four to five, six, seven hundred thousand dollars a year. And it's our health care dollars that pay for that. Another thing is when we talk about payers, we need to remember that insurance companies, et cetera, are not payers. We are the payers. They are the middle people who distribute it. And there's <clears throat> an interesting thing where the CEO of uh, oh, Cigna, I forget his name, Edward Cameron, somewhere woke up one day and said that his biggest fear was that American people will wake up and realize they don't need insurance companies anymore. 
But essentially, those are my thoughts. It's just comments, no question. They pretty much covered everything. Eleni did a great job in putting this all together. Kudos to her. I hope she gets a raise from it. <laughs> well, Walter, I'm not sure if I would be uh, um, keeping a, a good watch on your taxpayer dollars if I gave people raises that quickly. But um, I will I say- I wouldn't mind if you did, Kevin. <laughs> I will say this, that we're very fortunate to have Elena as part of the team. And uh, Walter, your points are, are very well taken. And uh, I did want to throw one question back to the uh, panel because you, you raised an important issue that uh, everyone has been grappling with for the last few years, and that's equity. And it's not just racial equity, but also rurality and um, whether or not uh, <clears throat> there's equity between um, rural and urban. And so if any of the, the panelists wish to weigh in on the uh, point on equity, we'd uh, greatly appreciate it. Go ahead, Elliot. Um, first, thank you for the comments. I think um, I agree with many of them. Um, I think one of the challenges is that we, we have essentially separate systems. Um, and they are inherently unequal. So Medicaid patients get less access to care than Medicare patients. Um, and you know, in the article that I referred to, the single system solution, I suggested that if we if we can get to the level where all, where all payers are paying similarly, um, which would be one way to eliminate the cost shift by gradual equalization, as as other states have done, then we would not be asking physicians to discriminate against the uninsured if it covered everybody we wouldn't be asking physicians to discriminate on the basis of ability to pay which is what we are doing now they would be making decisions based on who needs what care so i strongly support the, the concern about inequity um, and i think our payment and delivery system uh, reinforces the inequity that we see in the u.s healthcare system that was the neoliberalism pirate ellie <laughs> I, I certainly agree. And I, you know, I also really appreciate your comment that, you know, we use the term payer as sort of synonymous with insure, but it's coming at everybody's wallet. Taxes and, and premiums, that, and we forget that. Yep. And I, you know, I think nobody, you know, we've just got to keep that front and center. But I think, you know, the other point is that I think there are ways to directly address the rurality issue. And certainly should, I think there are ways to address some of the others, but, but it's gonna require a lot of, um, let's say political will and sustained effort. So that was the neoliberalism part too, but thanks for that, appreciate it. Okay, next I'm going to call on Jeff Tiemann. Jeff? Can you hear me? We can. Okay, great, thank you, Chair Mullen. Uh, I'm Jeff Team, and I'm the CEO of the Vermont Association of Hospitals. Um, I'm not, there's not time for me to respond to everything we've heard today. We'd need a lot more time for that. So I'm just going to comment on a few key points. I, I do want to take issue with the notion that Vermont is on a path to failure in health reform. I, I just don't view that as a fair observation, given the work being done and the investments being made by hospitals. Um, few other states have such a widespread voluntary commitment to value-based care. Um, even in the midst of a global pandemic. I also want to push back on the comment that was made that hospitals have advised the Green Mountain Care Board to simply do nothing. What we've advised over the last two years is to make sure that hospitals, which have been at the center of the pandemic from minute one, have the resources and bandwidth to take care of their patients during a major public health crisis that does not relent. And on that note, I think it's important to recognize the situation hospitals face today. Our workforce is in crisis with rapidly growing and deeply troubling numbers of staff out with COVID or with sick family members. Doctors, nurses, administrators, support staff exhausted, burned out and stressed. Hospitals are assigning leaders as we speak to work at the bedside, clinical leaders. They're deploying staff to the highest areas of need. They're postponing elective procedures in some cases and of course paying skyrocketing amounts for increasingly scarce travelers needed to meet the patient demand. In terms of vital transport, we're short on paramedics and medical transport teams, and hospitals are routinely calling 20 to 40 other hospitals as far away as Connecticut to place patients in the proper level of care. People are therefore waiting hours or days for transfers that would have happened rapidly before the pandemic. 
On the testing side, we have need that exceeds supply and availability, which causes anxiety and disruption in our hospitals, but of course also in schools and workplaces and even our homes. We're also working to provide the very best and most compassionate care for those with mental health needs. On any given day, our EDs have people waiting for placement, which, which also places a burden on those patients and their caregivers. So with all of this, it is disturbing to hear continued talk of reducing bed capacity and the hospital association will push back on that early and often to make sure that Vermonters can receive the hospital level care they need today and into the future. If you think reducing hospital capacity system is a good thing, whether from a workforce standpoint or a physical capacity standpoint, just look around right now at our hospitals and tell me if you think we should strive for fewer beds. I could not agree more on the need to make sure our system is affordable and that Vermonters can access the care where they need it at a fair price. We just also have to make sure we balance that with the need to make sure that our medical system is strong, stable, and ready. If we've learned nothing else from the pandemic, let's please learn that. And if hospitals are to continue their commitment to reform and value-based care, they also need to know and have confidence that the regulatory body is not going to attempt to make those decisions itself or ordain where and how care is delivered. That is not the goal of reform, and it should worry Vermonters if the Green Mountain Care Board is making decisions about their care that should be made by healthcare providers. So to close, um, I appreciate everyone's awareness of our hospital status, the need um, that we face and the future potential given where we are today at what I would say is by far the most challenging moment so far in the pandemic. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, Jeff. Valid points, but I do want to push back on uh, um, one thing. The Green Mountain Care Board is not going to be making decisions on uh, the, the care that is given to Vermonters um, other than trying to facilitate a discussion where everyone can come together. Um, similar to the format that was laid out by um, Elliot Fisher um, with the um, peace talks, but um, this is the beginning of a very long conversation, and I, I don't want anyone listening today that's tuned in to think that we're going to unilaterally um, say there's going to be fewer ICU beds in this location or this is going to happen. It's just not true, and I, I don't want anyone to uh, walk away from today's conversation with um, that as their uh, outcome. Next, I'm going to call on Taylor Hahn. Hello, so hi everyone. My name is Taylor and I am right now uh, currently a Middlebury school student. And uh, just uh, based on your presentation, which are really wonderful, and I have just uh, two questions. The first one is about um, uh, when you are uh, talking about the value-based care, uh, in my perspective, I understand it as to evaluate uh, the results of the care uh, uh, evaluate the quality and the result of the care instead of just the volume of the care. And so I have a specific question about the practical issues about how to actually to uh, put it into effect because I think it, when we are just thinking about quality, people, different people have different perspectives and they will have just a different standards upon that point. So I think it may just uh, uh, constitute some kind of like uh, complex issues. And my second question is actually about the price control. Uh, and um, when I heard about this kind of uh, 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 the proposal of having a, a global budget plan, uh, I think it, it means that uh, it will um, just different uh, all of the um, insurers uh, in, uh, all of the providers of the insurers how about just agree on a, a standard uh, price of the insurance and they will just pay beforehand uh, before fiscal year so that the hospitals can just um, uh, just a, a better uh, have a better use of their money so uh, in my so I think uh, there might be some problem with that uh, because if we just uh, fix uh, the insurance at a specific amount well that uh, caused the problem of not insufficient competition uh, which will lead to inefficiency later on so that's all about my questions thank you so much Taylor I just want to say that you give us uh, great hope for the future and um, they're, they're great questions. And by any chance, are you a student of Dr. Holmes? Yes, <laughs> I'm, I'm currently a student of Dr. Holmes and <laughs> Professor Lange. 
Thank you so much for uh, um, tuning in this afternoon, and uh, thank you for your uh, your great questions. Um, at this point, does does any member of the panel wish to uh, jump on one of those questions, or should I just continue with public comment? Well, I, I want to just explain what a hospital global budget is. Um, it's not intended to uh, to reduce compensation, but rather it's intended to uh, set a budget for a hospital for all of its operations for a year so that the hospital um, knows how much it will receive in revenue and be able to um, manage to deliver services to meet community need within that budget. Uh, and so the hospital has some incentives to find ways to become more efficient and thereby uh, generate some savings that accrue back to the hospital. Yeah, I, and in effect, I just, it takes out some of the uh, internal competition within a hospital and within mm -hmm. um, coordinating organizations with that hospital. If everybody is working on the same page to just make the uh, care the most efficient, um, they're not competing to uh, to show that uh, um, one department uh, brought in X amount of uh, dollars or um, you know, the visiting nurses did this or what have you. If everyone's working together, there's better coordination and probably better outcomes for the patient. Um, Dr. Uh, Henry, did you have yeah, something just, to say? Yeah, just I think to pick up on a, a point you made a minute ago, which I think is extraordinarily important. This whole process de depends on the people in the community leading the way to decide what services they need and how they are to be delivered in the future, not in the past. So, uh, you know, and I, I serve on the board of a community hospital and we do a community survey and this and that, but the voice of the community front and center in that, in public meetings, not just in a survey that somebody has a consultant do and then checks off, is essential and it will be absolutely critical to the success of any of this. So. I mean, I think the views of the hospital association, medical association, all of that are important, but they come from particular viewpoints and interests. And I say that having been a hospital director and a member of a hospital association and an AMA member. So, but this community view that, that I think is gonna have to really be taken into account. The other thing I would mention, is that I do not know the degree of cooperation between hospitals in Vermont. I do know that in Western Montana, my group is having a, a very good conversation with a hospital moderate distance away about what services could we uh, share. I mean, not antitrust, none of that stuff, but you know, somebody has more specialists in one area than another, and why duplicate that? So I, I think all of those need to happen, but community led. Great, thank you. Next, I'm going to call on uh, Rick Dooley. Rick. Hi, thanks, Kevin. Um, I want to uh, first just say thank you to all three speakers because I think that was uh, helpful and illuminating. And these are many of the issues that you know, Health First has been pushing for a long time. Um, I especially want to say with the um, comments on the price shift versus the cost shift, um, we frequently hear, and I've I've heard for six or seven years now. Anytime we start having conversations about what's happening other places in the in the country, we hear, well, well, that's not Vermont, that's not Vermont, that's not Vermont, um, and that's true. However, I think things like market forces, lack of competition, market dominance, um, you know, single uh, single players in the ball field, um, all those things are you know market concepts that are um, you know in existence and and do indeed apply in Vermont, and so I. I think that it's easy to say, you know, Vermont has this different system set up, but we also are not immune to those forces and they have not um, done well for us in the past. And that's it. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Rick. Next, I'm going to go to uh, Robert Hoffman. Thank you, Chair Mullen. Uh, it's great to see uh, my former mentor, Tom Walsh, joining all of you on the board. To see Elliot and Dr. Goodman, Dr. Fisher, both both of you touching after a couple of years of not seeing and hearing your voices. 
Uh, I want to start with the question and then follow it with a couple comments, if that's okay. Uh, Chair Mullen, could you say uh, or answer the hospital that um, controls 66% of healthcare spending in Vermont, uh, specifically the medical center's 52% market share? What is their value based payment per capita in 21? Well, this is a period of public comment, and we're not going to uh, go into a series of interrogatories, Robert. Okay. Well, I'll answer it for you. It's a 25% premium over Geisinger, where I happen to live now. Um, Geisinger, uh, very dissimilar to uh, Vermont, has University of Pittsburgh, Penn State Medical, uh, Lehigh Valley Hospital Network, <clears throat> St. Luke's, all competing in its yard. And so they're not capable of commanding the cost shift that Tom likes to talk about because they're not able to charge um, three to four times the Medicaid rate of their neighbors. So <clears throat> the value-based payment per capita for University of Vermont Medical Center is 8,000 versus two to 3,000 for its neighbors. And its Medicare is 12,005 which is two to three times its neighbors. So uh, I think most of the conversation today focused on a DRG and utilization level, and we're all really looking past the, the gorilla in the room, and that is a single player controlling two thirds of healthcare spending has successfully uh, gained the health reform efforts of the last decade to its advantage. And that can account for things such as workage, uh, worker shortage. When we talk about a system that's unwilling to negotiate with its nurses over a 10% raise, unless they accept uh, breaking up their right to organize. Uh, when we talk about a system that's willing to cancel leases with landlords, if they rent to independent practices, we're talking about a system that is uh, lacking competition and is pushing higher premium costs out into health service areas where the commercial payers, as they've told you repeatedly when you've asked, why will they not sign up? The providers are not going to take this higher price risk from Burlington that's been pushed out into their HSA and accept that responsibility and risk when they feel they have little power to affect change back in a higher premium cost center. So, you know, it's, it's opportune that Clover is coming before you all today. You have an opportunity to open up lower cost care settings to provide uh, procedures that currently are being uh, billed at much higher rates in high cost centers. <clears throat> I would challenge you all, as I have frequently, to consider the role that this single player in its consolidation efforts is having in a small state. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Robert. Um, next, I'm going to go to Aaron Tobias and then to Mike Fisher, and then we're going to take a, a bio break before we move on the conversation to Clover Health. Aaron. Thank you. Uh, hey everyone, thanks for your time today. I really appreciate all the uh, the insights. Uh, I'm relatively new to all this. I'm also a member of Professor Holmes's class. Um, no, I thought it was very interesting hearing about uh, the push to move away from the fee for service uh, structure and that many hospitals currently have. Uh, and I remember it was an interesting point brought up that um, you know you can reduce the amount of people within a hospital by increasing the emergence of electronic ICUs. Uh, but I'm just wondering how the emergence of those capitalistic companies like Teladoc or American Well or Intuitive Surgical, who can potentially improve the productivity of these hospitals, how that would coincide with an effort to move away from the fee-for-service structure. Because it seems like those companies uh, basically gain money and profit through service and through production. So I'm wondering how like trying to grow those companies uh, would potentially impact or if it would potentially deter the ability to uh, move away from fee-for-service. Thank you. So it's a great question, and it's one that uh, we've been uh, hearing a lot about over the last couple of years. And uh, 
kudos to uh, Dartmouth Hitchcock for the uh, advances that they made um, quickly um, so that we hear from uh, example doctors at uh, Southwestern Vermont Medical Center in Bennington where they can have a consult from the uh, patient's room with a specialist and um, have the cameras on the patient and uh, some amazing things are happening. So um, I, th I think that uh, um, really it could be hospitals themselves that become the, the main um, players in uh, providing those telehealth services, but it could be external competition and external competition could be what keeps the hospitals honest in this whole thing moving forward. So a great question. So again, I'm going to uh, Mike Fisher and then we're gonna go to a bio break because I did get a, a few texts about an hour and a half ago asking for one and uh, I've dragged this out for about as long as I can without uh, having a few board members. <coughs> So Mike Fisher, you were the last person in public comment. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, board, and thank you, everyone who's participated in the, in the um, presenters. Um, um, I, I guess I, I want to, I'm Mike Fisher, I'm the healthcare advocate. Um, and I want to start by recognizing uh, the passion that the hospital association expressed a few minutes ago. Um, and to, uh, I'm not going to pull it off, but I would like to match that passion on behalf of Vermonters who are struggling to afford care. And um, and so uh, on that, and I and thank you for uh, Elliot Fisher for you know citing the household survey number of 40% uh, are underinsured, um, and. Um, we have been spending a great deal of time talking to people who uh, are uh, have medical debt or who are afraid of medical debt and to understand the dynamic that they face when when they are forced to make a financial decision instead of a healthcare decision and um and so um i i really just wanted to sort of bring that voice to this table uh i i think a number of the presenters uh, um, gave a real shout out to that dynamic. And so I thank you for doing that. And um, and I appreciate the presentation. Thank you, Mike. So at this time, um, I did see a couple more hands that popped up, but uh, we do have uh, business to uh, conduct on Clover Health. And I would ask if uh, um, anybody has any further public comment, if they could email it to the board and we'll make sure that it gets uh, posted on our website. Um, so at this time, I'm going to uh, um, thank the panel for an excellent uh, afternoon discussion and uh, um, giving us your valuable time and really creating a lot of, uh, of uh, food for thought. So we're going to uh, put the meeting in recess until 3.20 and we'll be back for a discussion on uh, Clover Health. Thank you, everyone. Welcome back, everyone. Um, before we start with the uh, discussion on uh, Clover Health, um, I understand, Elena, that you wanted to um, give us a homework assignment and that you were trying to uh, raise your hand as I was uh, going to the bio break, so go ahead. That's okay, thank you so much. Um, and I will be very quick because I know it's been a long day. So here is your homework assignment uh, as soon as I can find the right screen. And Elena, it's the homework assignment for the board members, correct? Yes, okay. and I'm just not sure why it's not. Oh, here it is, okay. Elena's getting ready to be a professor. <laughs> Love it. Okay, so um, I'll, it's quickly just two slides. So, um, you know, based on what we've observed through the hospital budget reviews over the last five plus years, um, as well as various analyses, insights from thought leaders on hospital sustainability, affordability, and healthcare reform. So largely today's conversation, and I've listed here for you a lot of relevant um, recent um, kind of speakers we've had or different um, kind of resources that would be helpful for thinking about this. And I will be sharing with you a draft of the key findings for the legislative report, but which I think have implications for our ongoing work at the board. Um, and so I, I'd like you to take a look at those and kind of identify, you know, where where do you agree? What, where are your priorities? And what do you think I've missed? Um, so what are, you know, the key, key findings that you think are most important? 
So that's the first piece. And the second piece is, um, you know, this is a little preview. The long term recommendations that I will hopefully, you know, will flesh out in this report to the legislature, um, I think will mirror a lot of, you know, what we heard today about process for the obvious reasons that we, you know, we haven't been able to um, bring hospitals to the table given the pandemic. Um, and we want to allow space for them to, to weigh in. Um, and to shape what that looks like. So, um, you know, so this will allow providers to continue partnering with the state and developing the shared vision. Um, and then this process map would also, or a process oriented approach would allow us to map out connections to the next agreement potentially with the with our federal partners, as well as any um, legislative changes based on that um, shared vision that should be required. So I, I would like to get your thoughts on this process approach and kind of are there guardrails that you think we should include um, is this the right approach? Um, and then, you know, thinking about what we can do, you know, inside internally. And I think there were some conversations today and some um, recommendations from some of the speakers about how we can evolve our regulatory processes in the interim um, to, you know, move from a sledgehammer to more of a scalpel, even though we might not be quite there. Um, and so, you know, what what is your vision uh, for hospital budgets? particularly, but also ACO budget review certification, insurance rate review, you know, our CON process, and, you know, thinking about, I think we've talked about the next agreement already, but are there other things that we could do um, right now, given our current authority to help tackle some of these challenges? Um, so just some food for thought, and if you'd like to kind of brainstorm together, I'm happy to meet one-on-one, -on -one, um, but look forward to hearing your, um, your wish for this direction. Thank you. And Chair Mullen, I'll turn it back to you now. I just got a text that Chair Mullen has lost power temporarily. So I think what I'll do is I will shift it over to Russ. Is that right? And Russ, maybe you can start and Chair Mullen will be here in momentarily, hopefully, probably via phone. OK, uh, I'm happy to go ahead. Um, I'm uh, for the record, Russ McCracken, staff attorney with the board. I'm here presenting what is a procedural uh, procedural question, really, from for uh, in related in regards to Clover Health Partners, which is a direct contracting entity um, operating in Vermont. Um, Clover Health submitted their FY22 budget uh, to the board. Um, in accordance with the guidance that the board had promulgated. Along with that budget, uh, or with the budget, Clover Health included a request that the board um, declined to hold a hearing concerning the concerning Clover Health's FY22 budget, uh, which the board is allowed to do under Rule 5404 for ACOs that have fewer than uh, 10,000 attributed lives in the state in that year. Um, in support of its request, Clover Health notes that they're expected to have uh, under 2,000 attributed lives in Vermont. And they also cite uh, that their budget submission includes confidential and or non-public financial information, company trade secrets, and other proprietary information. Um, for which they've requested confidentiality. We're still working through the, um, we're still working through that confidentiality request. Um, Rule 5404 does say that um, the board may decline to hold a hearing concerning a proposed budget submitted by an ACO that's expected to have fewer than 10,000 attributed lives in Vermont during the next budget year, or, or it would not be assuming the risk. Uh, the rule doesn't give us criteria um, for when or why the board should decline to hold the hearing, so it's really in the discretion of the board. Um, and so the, the request having been made by Clover, we wanted to present it to the board for consideration. Um, the board could hold a hearing, hold a separate hearing, with Clover Health to um, present its FY22 budget, um, or alternatively, what uh, 
staff had been thinking about and wanted to offer for the board was that we could move directly to the staff um, review of the budget presentation of recommendations, uh, board review, and deliberation in um, a regular uh, public scheduled public board meeting. Um, I say that in light of both the small size of Clover and the fact that Clover was before the board um, not too many months ago, uh, giving a presentation that did cover a lot of Clover's uh, proposed operations in, in the state. Um, so with that, I would turn the question over to um, uh, Chair Mullen. I, I note um, that Clover's attorney has also uh, joined us here. Um, <clears throat> Thank you, Russ, and uh, my apologies to everyone. Uh, we had a quick power outage here. And so uh, I missed the beginning, but I'm sure that uh, Jess had it under uh, um, good control for that. Um, and I have in my notes, Russ, that you had uh, mentioned uh, that the healthcare advocate wished to um, address this issue as well. Is that is this the appropriate time for him to do so? I, I know that the healthcare advocate's office does want to make a public comment. Um, regarding the request. So uh, I think if 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 it's OK with uh, you, Mr. Chair, it might be an appropriate time for them to do that. OK, so Sam, are you um, doing the speaking? I am. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Um, actually, more of a clarification question um, because I wasn't sure what the recommendation from the staff would be about this. I mean, we're in support of a public hearing. Um, but Russ, would you mind clarifying what you meant by having a public meeting and a staff recommendation? Sure. If we look at um, the process for One Care Vermont, for example, we have that spread out over multiple meetings. One meeting would be dedicated to the ACO coming in before the board and presenting its budget and fielding questions about it. And then at a sub and subsequent to that hearing at a meeting, we would have staff present an analysis and recommendation for the board with respect to the ACO's budget. In this case, what I was suggesting was perhaps if the board were comfortable with it, we would move directly to that second step where the staff presents an analysis and recommendation with respect to the ACO's budget. Um, and we would do that at a, you know, at a normal public board meeting. And I, I do think in it, you know, if, candidly, I haven't been carefully through um, all of the budget submission, but if there are questions that arise in the course of review, um, I think staff would feel comfortable uh, presenting those to, to Clover in writing and getting responses that way, um, similar to what we do uh, for One Care Vermont. Okay. Uh, may I respond, Chair Mullen? Certainly. Uh, thanks, Russ. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think. The healthcare advocate would would support any kind of poor public setting that would allow for the general public and the board to ask questions specific. I think if I'm understanding this correctly, this forum wouldn't require Clover to answer questions in a public setting. So I'm wondering if um, that's a possibility. Um, because I do, on behalf of the HCA, we have concerns about the business model and practices that Clover has that we documented previously in our remarks when the board was considering waiving the oversight regulations in the summer. Um, so just wondering if you, sorry to respond with another clarification question, but um, it's an important issue to us. I don't know if that was a question for me, Mr. Chair, but I'm happy to. Go ahead, Russ. Try to parse it out. I. I um, I had, in thinking through it, 
I had assumed that Clover or their representatives would be at the meeting in which staff presented um, analysis and recommendations. Um, I hadn't considered whether that would be whether their attendance would be required or not. So could leave that as a point for consideration by the board. So Russ, and again, my apologies. I missed the beginning of the conversation. Um, is there a request for the board to make a decision today on on what type of hearing would be held? Is that uh, what the board is looking at? Essentially, yes. The um, Clover Health, in their along with their budget submission, requested that the board, um, as it's permitted to do by rule, decline to hold a hearing um, concerning the their FY22 budget submission. Uh, so that that's the question um, that's being presented to the board. So board members, do you have questions of uh, Russ? I don't have a question. This is Robin, but I'll just jump in um, with my thoughts in case it's helpful for anyone else. Uh, I, I personally um, am fine not doing the type of hearing that we typically do with one care. One care submission is um, quite voluminous as is necessary to understand their program. In this case, it's an off the shelf national Medicare program that Clover is participating in. Um, and so I feel like uh, at least the, the payment parameters and those sorts of things are uh, pretty well laid out in the participation agreement, et cetera. Um, I do like I do think it is important for Clover to be at the meeting where we have the staff recommendation um, to respond to that recommendation potentially if if they have issues. Um, on the other hand, it's their, you know, the burdens on them uh, to prove their case. So if they don't show up, you know that will that is what it is um and i do think it is important that we do get questions answered but i i think those uh likely can be done in writing at least the questions that i've sort of identified that i have so that's my thinking on it given the size and scope of um the budget and and the attribution and those sorts of things other questions or thoughts from board members? In the interest of time, I'll just say that I completely concur with what Robin just said. Uh, Chair Mullen, this is Tom Walsh, and a question for Russ, if possible. Go ahead. Uh, with this, the smaller size and scope of this application, if we uh, treat this one applicant this way, is there a risk of other entities entering into uh, the state of Vermont staying below the 10,000 lives covered threshold and kind of taking advantage of that as a loophole. Is there anything we should be worried about there? Um, <clears throat> broadly speaking, the way that we prepared the guidance that Clover responded to with the budget submission, it, it was done generically. It was not um, specific to Clover Health. So any entity that kind of falls into the same classification of being Medicare only and under that 10,000 life threshold would respond to the same um, the same guidance. They are the only entity that meets that criteria that has submitted an FY22 budget. Um, so I don't think so to I think to answer your your question are we if we set up this procedure um, of not having them come in and do a presentation of the budget, could we? Does, does that does that prevent the board from having presentations from other ACOs in future years? And and so I would say no to that. It doesn't. Um, 
you know, it may, if there were other ACOs this year, we would treat them all the same. And I think in future years, we'll treat all ACOs the same. Uh, but uh, the board isn't committing to that particular procedure for future years. Well, thank you. You answered more clearly than I asked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my, t my take on this is uh, there might be some marginal value in holding a hearing, um, <clears throat> but only marginal because this is a very small uh, uh, application. It is significantly different, you know, than um, the other uh, kind of Medicare plans. Um, but, and and so that coming into our community is something that, you know, I think over time people need to become aware of. Um, you know, Robin has, uh, you know, clearly laid out that a lot of this um, is kind of predetermined. It's not as flexible, you know, <clears throat> as it might be with, uh, say, one care. Um, I also worry about staff burden. Um, you know, putting together a hearing, it you know does take some effort. So I think if uh, I, I so I, I think the budget discussion is uh, open enough, um, allowable enough for folks to get their questions asked and, uh, and answered in a in a public way that I I feel comfortable going in that direction. Okay. Any questions? Or Further discussion from the board? The only the other thing I would chime in with is I do think it's important for the healthcare advocates concerns to be addressed and uh, asked. So, but I do think that um, that could be a written process. Okay. Um, Robin, are you prepared to make a motion before I go to public comment? Sure. Uh, I move that uh, we approve Clover Health's request to waive a presentation of their budget and proceed with the process as outlined by Russ. Is there a second? I'll second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there a further board discussion before I open it up for public comment? The only thing I'll just also just clarify is that, as I'm sure people are aware, in the ACO process, all of our deliberations are in public. So this, there's still lots of public process left to go. Yep. Okay, so I'll open it up for public comment at this time. Does any member of the public wish to offer comment at this time? And I'm going to call on Walter Carpenter first and then David Alt. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, I just want to back up uh, the healthcare advocate and Robin on the public hearing. It should, we should have it, however marginal or non marginal it is, and open up more as much public as possible because it's important for us Medicare recipients to understand what this is about and what these DCEs are going to do to us. Thank you, Walter. David? Th thank you. Um, so yeah, I appreciate the comments so far with respect to the, the healthcare advocate. Absolutely. Uh, oh, first of all, I'm, I'm David Alt, counsel for, for Clover. Um, you know, absolutely would want and be willing to answer and respond to any questions that the healthcare advocate has. I think one thing that is particularly useful and helpful in this instance is that, as I understand it, the healthcare advocate's office is under the same uh, confidentiality rules as the Green Mountain Care Board. And so that is open. And, and if we do that by a you know written question and answer process, um, you know, it, it allows for hopefully a the kind of discussion and responses that um, the healthcare advocates office would would like and, and, and I hope would be helpful to their office. So I, I think that um, the, the process that's been laid out would would address that. Um, and again, Clover's happy to answer not just, uh, you know, the, the board's questions, but healthcare advocate questions uh, as, as well. Um, and um, Robin, to, to your point about uh, Clover attending um, 
the the, the upcoming meeting. Um, I know they I mean they're not I, I can't ask them on the call, but I know they'd be more than happy to to be present. Um, I guess one one question that I'd have and, and that we've asked in the past is with respect to submission of the um, of the requirements set forth in the guidance. Um, you know, it it hasn't been clear to us. You know, what is the the review standard or the review process? So I know you said the the burden is on Clover to prove their case. I'm not sure uh, what that burden is or what is meant to be proved. Um, I know there's a submission requirement, and and they have met those requirements and are happy to meet requirements. They they appreciate the opportunity to be in Vermont, but to the extent there is something that must be proven or if there is a burden. Uh, whatever those parameters for review are or standards for approval, um, it would be helpful to know what those are in advance of uh, any meeting. Thank you. Thank you, David. Is there any other public comment? Seeing and hearing none, I'll throw it back to the board for any further discussion prior to a vote. Hearing none, um, we'll call the question. All those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, please signify by saying nay. So Russ, uh, um, we'll task you with uh, following up with the healthcare advocate and with uh, David to make sure that everything is being coordinated. And um, have you got uh, um, an idea on a proposed date yet or not? I don't have an exact date yet, and I'll have to, um, I think, coordinate with the rest of the team as well. But it was, um, we had been talking about late January, early February. Well, late January is coming awful fast, so I'll leave it up to you to see if uh, everything can be handled that quickly. But uh, <laughs> just well, stay in touch. <laughs> Thank you, Russ. Yes, will do. So is there any old business to come before the board? Hearing none, is there any new business to come before the board? Hearing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed signify by saying nay. Thank you everyone. Have a great rest of the day.